uh, endo ultrasound, we have exoanal ultrasound, we have pudendal nerve terminal motor latency, we have sensory testing, we have difficography, we have gut transit study. So this is all in our armamentorium. So I thought, let me start by just starting with the basic physiology, anatomy, and manometry. No, 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 no. And then in our, if it is well received, then with our uh, esteemed uh, panelists today, we will continue it with the blessings of Dr. Achla and Dr. Ranjana and Dr. J.B. Sharma. Uh, with these words, I would like to invite Dr. Achla to, uh, you know, give her her wise thoughts on this thought process of mine. Uh, Dr. Achla, please. Thank you. Thank you, Geeta. I must congratulate you on choosing this very uncommon, unusual topic, but which really needs attention. We as gynecologists or urogynecologists, you know, we are very familiar with the POP, anatomy, physiology, incontinence, but when it comes to anorectal problems, we really are at loss. And you know, uh, it is our favorite pelvic floor muscle, the levator. The puborectalis is a part of it, which does get affected when we have these anorectal problems. Especially the women who have fecal incontinence, they have a miserable quality of life and they never come to us. And we never even ask for such problems. We are propagating about urinary incontinence so much, but we never you know, talk much about fecal incontinence, which is which does occur in 50% of the women who have urinary incontinence also, but they don't pay much attention to it because they think it is what they have to live with and don't even investigate. We don't even know what investigations to do, you know? So I think it is a very appropriate that as a gynecologist and as urogynecologist, we are aware of whatever we can do, where we have to refer, you know, they're not all the problems which can be solved by surgery. That's now which may be solved just by doing some exercises. So we have to know only by knowing the anatomy, physiology, and the investigation required, we can know what is to be done for the patient. We can counsel her. We can reassure that some bit of problem may be solved. And not, you know, sometimes go ask them to go for surgery, which will probably worsen their problems. So, uh, Geeta, I, uh, again, congratulate you. And I think we all need a little bit of training in that. And you have collected a galaxy of speakers. I would have loved to welcome Dr. Deeds. You know, when I did my first thesis with Karishma on uh, urogynecology, we have sent our uh, protocol to him for, you know, approval because it was on ultrasound. And he was very kind that he, you know, gave us the response. And of course, all the people you've collected for uh, anorectal anatomy, physiology, and uh, they will all teach us something. And I hope we will also have a short training, you know. Thank you, Geeta. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think I should not be spending much more time and we can start the webinar. And my best wishes for this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Achla, for those very kind and encouraging words. Now I hand over to Dr. Renuka, who will be the MOC for today. Thank you, Dr. Geeta. A very good afternoon to all my senior faculty members and all delegates who have joined us today. So without any further delay, I would like to start session one of today's scientific program. To chair the session, I would like to invite Dr. Ranjana Sharma, ma'am, Ma'am is a senior consultant, ops and gynae, urogyne, laparoscopic and robotic surgery, Indrapras Apollo Hospital and Apollo Cradle Hospital in New Delhi. She is chairperson I AICC RCOG North Zone, and uh, she is uh, executive committee member of AOGT, Delhi Endoscopy Society, and NARCHI. Dr. Chandra Mansukhani, ma'am. Ma'am is senior consultant, ops and gynae at Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi. She is also, vice, uh, she's a vice president ISOPAP New Delhi chapter and vice president IMS Delhi chapter also. Welcome, ma'am. And Dr. Ashna Kumari, ma'am. She, ma'am, is assistant professor at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. She is the winner of Foxy Traveling Fellowship Award uh, 2016. She has around 25 publications in PubMed and index national and international journals. Areas of interest is infertility, urogyne, and endoscopy. Dr. Karishma Teriyani, ma'am. 
she is consultant at center of urogynecology and public health new delhi her areas of interest are urogynecology pelvic reconstructive surgery and menopause she is the member of educational committee and prolapse committee iuga i welcome you all ma'am and i now request dr ranjana sharma ma'am to please invite our first speaker dr sandhya jain she will be talking about anatomy of perineum and ls anal sphincter today ma'am please invite dr sandhya all right so thank you renuka very much for the kind words thank and uh, good afternoon everybody uh, i really must congratulate uh, geeta for coming out with such a innovative idea and uh, move from our usual you know restrict restricting restricting ourselves up to the vagina and going a little bit posterior so uh, thank you uh, geeta for arranging this uh, webinar and uh, again you know achla and her team have always been at the forefront to support such a such an activity so uh, i am very very grateful to all of you to include to make me a part of it so um, as geeta already said uh, i think you know it's very important for us to include uh, uh, the urinary symptoms and bowel symptoms in our history taking which is actually sadly not a part of our gynae history taking it stops at the urinary and it means once you finish your organ a gynae menstrual history and all, and that, that uh, the, all of that and then when it comes to finding out we really apart from uh, who to uh, you know investigate and uh, where we also don't know how to investigate and what to investigate actually when we have a bowel problem and it's like a pandora box and we don't know wh what to pick up from from that so all for all that you know we are going to be uh, you know educated um today and uh, we are really looking forward to this so i have a great pleasure in inviting uh, sandhya uh, sandhya jain for the first talk and that's so useful that like the anatomy of the anorectal area and she's a professor of uh, obs and gynae at university college of medical sciences and gtb hospital she is a very keen Uh, urogynecologist and special interest in minimally invasive surgery too and vaginal surgery she has uh, you know has been a strong pillar of all our urogyne activities for for so many years now sandhya and you have really moved up very efficiently so she has received so many um, uh, national awards and she has been a gold medalist uh, when she was awarded the best paper research paper award and then she also had rcog oxford overseas award and she had now more than 90 publications and edited two books sandhya can't wait to hear your talk so the <laughs> stage stage is yours thank you um yeah thank you so much ma'am thank you so much for those kind words i feel blessed to have seniors like dr ranjana ma'am dr achla ma'am dr jb sharma who's been my pg guide as well and uh, thank you for those kind words and good noon to all and a special thanks to dr geeta and aogd for this opportunity uh, to speak today uh, do you want to continue one second ma'am i'll just uh, share my screen and yeah so ma'am is my screen visible Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, Th yeah. Thank you so much. Let's so I'll be really speaking. The, yeah, thanks. I did. I did, ma'am. I did. Yeah. So I'll be talking about anatomy of perineum and the anal sphincter. That's the topic allotted to me, and I'll be defining perineum, superficial perineal pouch, deep perineal pouch, mostly concentrating on anal embryology and anal sphincter, which is the theme today, actually. So we are aware of pelvic diaphragm, the levator ani, which it's actually a V-shaped hammer, and which merges on both side, and we have openings for the uh, urinary tract, vagina, and the GI tract. So So, just summarizing the muscles of uh, this is how the pelvic floor looks from above. Me, it has three parts. The middle most fibers are actually of the puborectalis muscle, which we know are very important for providing voluntary co continence at the level of pelvic floor. They form a sling at the anorectal junction, which keeps it pulled forward and maintains the anorectal angle. Extremely important when there is a sudden rise in intra-abdominal pressure, the levator and I would instantly contract and close these openings. So that's the puborectalis. Just lateral to that is the pubococcygeus muscle, 
which again goes posteriorly and blends with the perineal body, another very important landmark in perineum, which maintains the entire biomechanics of the superficial and deeper spaces. And posteriorly puborectalis also gets attached to the, uh, the levator plate and, and this, the cossex. A little lateral is the third part of levator in I, that is the iliococcygeus. So these are the three parts. And posteriorly to cover up the space, there is a coccygeus muscle and the piriformis as well. Laterally on both sides, it's the obturator internus muscle. This is how it looks from a sagittal view, but here it's important to talk about these small, small muscles which are uh, present in the perineum, which are uh, apart from levator ani providing a very important role in the continence at the level of urinary and the gastrointestinal symptom uh, system. So these are the small muscles at the level, level of the perineum. So defining perineum, it's the lowermost part of the uh, female trunk. Below uh, the levator ani muscle, what all is there is actually called perineum. And uh, it has openings for GI, urinary, and the genital system. And uh, it has, again, two parts, the superficial perineal pouch and the deep perineal pouch, which I'll be detailing. So the superficial pouch has all the superficial tissues like Mons, labia majora, minora, prepuce, frenulum, and the vestibule. Uh, if we go slightly, uh, so the boundaries are the mons anteriorly, laterally it's the inferior, uh, the middle side of the thigh, and posteriorly it's the uh, buttock. So these are the superficial boundaries of the superficial uh, of the perineum. Then uh, going a little deeper inside, we have anteriorly the arcuate ligament, laterally the ischiopubic rami, and then the sacrotuberous ligament, and the cossex, which forms the boundary. Here, it's important to mention about perineal body, which is actually an important landmark and lies somewhere in the middle. And if an arbitrary line is drawn, it divides the perineum into an anterior urogenital triangle and a posterior anal triangle. So this is how if you draw an arbitrary line through the perineum, it divides it into two triangles, one anterior and one posterior. So again, if we just peel off the skin and the fascia, which is a continuation from the anterior abdominal wall, that is the coles fascia. So below comes the superficial muscles. So these are all there in the perineal pouch. Here we can see laterally going is the ischiocavernosus muscle. Encircling the introitus is the bulbocavernosus muscle. And going laterally are the superficial transverse muscle, muscle so actually forming a triangle. And here somewhere is the bulbo vestibule, which is an erectile tissue, and posterolaterally the Bartholin glands. So these are all components of the superficial pouch. And then uh, talking further, there's rich vascular supply, mostly from the internal pudendal artery, nerve supply from the ileoinguinal nerve, and the branches of pudendal nerve, very important S234 and perineal branch of the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve and the coccygeal and sacral nerves posteriorly, S4, S5. So this is a coronal section through perineum. We are very familiar. So the, it has uterus opening of vagina and we can see here, it's the levator in eye muscles. Everything below it is perineum. Here we can see this black perineal membrane, which differentiates the superficial from the deeper pouch. So below the perineal membrane is everything the superficial uh, a perineal pouch and here uh, uh, in between the superficial face, uh, pouch is having two important muscles. One is the sphincter urethra, that is the urinary uh, uh, continence, uh, external uh, urinary uh, content, uh, extrinsic uh, urinary in uh, this thing, uh, meters, and, uh, uh, and the deep uh, transverse perineal muscle. So this is the deep pouch between the super, superior fascia and the uh, perineal membrane. And I've talked about the structures here and it importance very importantly, the extrinsic uh, urinary sphincter mechanism. So this is just uh, 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 how the constriction of the detrusor muscle uh, will uh, form uh, the internal urinary meatus, which is for the uh, which has uh, visceral control. And at the level of deep transverse perineum over here is the uh, sphincter urethra muscle, which is uh, giving voluntary control of the urinary tract. And down below it's all perineum. So uh, talking particularly about the urinary uh, continence, it is not just one muscle which wraps around the urethra, but actually there is a sphinx. The muscle complex are three muscles. So one is the uh, muscle layer, which is encircling the urethra. 
one layer which is called the urethrovaginal muscle is encircling both the urethra and vagina and constricts, uh, constricts to close both the tubes simultaneously. And another, the third one is the compressor urethry muscle, which arises from inferior pubic rama on both sides. And kind of uh, when it contracts, it just uh, uh, presses on the urethra and closes the sphincter. So all the three together give rise to the external uh, uh, urinary sphincter. Uh, a word about perineal body because it's one of the very vital structure of the uh, perineum and it's important because it, it's a coordinator between the deeper and the superficial tissue and if this gets damaged during delivery, a lot of disturbance occur uh, as far as the genital tract and the uh, defecatory system is concerned. So it's level three support of LANSI and consists of muscle collagen and elastic tissues. And here, the superficial and deep transverse perineal muscles, bulbous spongiosus, levator ani, external urinary sphincter, longitudinal muscle coat of anal canal. So many muscles converge here at this point. And uh, so its rupture can lead to pelvic organ prolapse. And uh, so we can assess the perineal body using modified Oxford grading system. That is, we put two finger in the vagina and ask the patient to lift or sort of squeeze those fingers and we assess the tone of the perineal body and the uh, levator at this level. Um, then I can skip this one. Um, so coming now to the anatomy of the anal sphincter. Uh, so this is the gut developing and the distal sac of the hindgut is actually a sac which is called the cloaca and here uh, from here will arise the rectum and the anal canal. So um, around uh, uh, the six, seven weeks, uh, this cloaca is joined by elantois which is another sacular structure. And uh, in between the two is the urorectal septum. This is a mesenchymal tissue which starts growing between the two. So it's the cloaca which is joined by the allantois. And in between the two, slowly this urorectal septum starts uh, proliferating, which is a mesenchymal uh, thing. And what will happen, the anteriorly allantois will separate now from the posterior cloaca. So the allantois anteriorly will, will give rise to urogenital sinus, which will lead to formation of the urinary tract and the genital system, uh, the distal part of the uh, vagina. And uh, posteriorly, the cloaca is now totally separated. It is covered by a cloacal membrane and it is all endodermal in origin. And uh, at the cloacal membrane, there is a, a ectodermal tissue on the other side, which forms kind of anal pit or the proctodium. So finally, we have a cloaca, which is endodermal in origin, and the distal most end of it is covered by some uh, ectodermal tissue, which also starts proliferating. And finally, the cloacal membrane disappears. And what we get is the formation of the anal canal. So finally, it's important to tell here that the one second, just. Anal canal has a dual embryological origin. It is around four centimeter cylinder. The upper two third of the cylinder is endodermal in origin from the cloaca and the lower around 13, 14 centimeter is ectodermal in origin from the uh, embryological proctoderm, which proliferated and uh, led to it. It has very important implications. The junction of the two is uh, at the level of pectinate line or the dentate line from where the epithelium changes from the columnar to the squamous. Also two centimeter from the anal verge, we have the white line of Hilton and this white line demarcates uh, the uh, change from stratified squamous epithelium of the skin to the non-stratified squamous epithelium. But most importantly is the level of pectinate line where the, uh, from the embryological point of view. So the lymphatics also change above the pectinate line, it's internal iliac and below is the inguinal nodes. Then the epithelium is also columnar there and stratified squamous the, on the other hand. The supply is from superior rectal above and from the middle and inferior rectal below. Hemorrhoids above the pectinate line are internal hemorrhoids. They are not painful and below are external, which are painful. And the nerve supply is also different uh, from above the pectinite, pectinate line, it's inferior hypogastric plexus and below it's the inferior rectal. So finally, we come specifically what concerns to us the most, the surgical anal canal, which is actually a four centimeter cylinder and it begins at the anorectal junction and ends at the anal verge 
and there is another uh, anatomical anal canal which starts from the pectinate line till the anal verge we are not concerned with anatomical anal canal because when we want surgical repair we are totally concerned with the, with the entire tube of 4 cm in our repair so inorectal junction is marked by the uh, one second um okay so this is the transverse so rectum can be identified this the superior middle and inferior valves the the transverse uh, lines and uh, the anus is by these scripts and at the after the pectinate line these scripts disappear and uh, we can identify the anorectling which is very well will posteriorly and laterally so it's not in but there are also some fibers from the deep external sphincter the conjoined longitudinal muscle and the highest point of the internal sphincter which form a sling at the anorectal junction and it's important because when there is sudden rise in intraabdominal pressure or uh, uh, problem and provides continence nation to assess the tone of the uh, sphincters which are below the level of puborectalis so coming now to the sphincters so we have talked about puborectalis muscle which is slightly at the higher level of that 4 cm uh, anal uh, tube then uh, lower uh, than that is the sphincter mechanism which has two sphincters the external sphincter and the anal sphincter so uh, they they form circular rings around the uh, anal canal taking you through each of them so external sphincter is voluntary and one can contract it but it remains contracted for 1 to 3 minutes and then eventually the contraction goes off but it does provide a voluntary control it is beefy red in color but generally we are not able to identify separately but probably in a fresh tear we can identify its beefy red and it's composed of skeletal muscle and it is around that entire length of 4 cm of the anal tube unlike internal sphincter which is no, it doesn't go beyond the white line so that's the difference and in uh, the, the sphincter is supplied by the inferior rectal branch of the pudendal nerve and the sacral nerve so this is how the external sphincter looks like the super subcutaneous part is what gives puckering and it's very superficial and just above that is the superficial and further above is the deep external anal sphincter and you can see it's merging with the fibers of puborectalis and that forms the anorectal ring so that's the external anal sphincter forming a continuous 4 cm circular uh, 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 wrapping around the anal canal so this is how it is topmost is the puborectalis then the deep part of external sphincter the uh, the the superficial part of external sphincter the subcutaneous and below the anal verge then the longitudinal uh, this conjoint longitudinal muscle which is a continuation from rectum so this comes as a longitudinal muscle and comes between the external and the anal sphincter and it provides structural support in the pelvis to the anorectum so that's the second muscle and now coming to the internal sphincter so it is inside so outside it's the external sphincter then the conjoint longitudinal muscle and the internal sphincter we can see it is just short uh, it is finishing at the line of at the level of white line so it's not the low down at the external sphincter it's involuntary and um, and then its nerve supply is by superior hypogastric and pelvic splanchnic nerves so uh, it is typically described to be pearly white in color and just uh, above the mucosa it's the uh, when we see this complete perineal tear the retracted fibers white fibers of the uh, internal sphincter can be seen so a word about incontinence although it will be covered in detail so above it's the puborectalis which is giving some voluntary control below that is the sphincter mechanism maintaining continence internal sphincter is extremely important and provides 70% of the resting tone and uh, external sphincter and puborectalis they provide voluntary control and can remain contracted for 1 to 3 minutes now uh, even if uh, uh, the entire sphincter is gone due to oasis obstetric anal injury puborectalis can still maintain some uh, to, uh, tone and uh, solid feces uh, will still be contained but if liquid feces patient will not be able to contain if, if the entire sphincter is gone and uh, so that's briefly about it 
And this is just a diagram of how a complete tear looks like. The uh, upper part, they'll be torn external, uh, the superficial and deep transverse perineae, then the sphincter mechanism come. And this is one patient I want to show. She came in January to us. She had a very bad neglected, and it, it was like this very, very... Um, Everything opened up, sphincters gone laterally, both the external sphincter, then the internal. And we did a repair and there was some infection. Again, we did. And finally, this is the outcome. Now she's totally continent. And last follow-up was in last OPD two days back. And she's doing pretty well. So I think uh, I thank and conclude uh, with that. And thank you for your patience. So I stop, uh, man. It was a Ma wonderful you know, presentation, Sandhya. Yeah. Really, so you presented so with so much clarity. Yeah, so thank you so much. I think, you know, yeah, right from every for, from the beginners to advanced, you know. It will be very clear to everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sandhya. It was really a crisp lecture. And you explained all the points of the anatomy of the anorectal uh, area. Because that is the most important thing, especially for the PGs, even for the learners. If you understand the anatomy in detail, then only you will understand the physiology. And then only you will be able to correlate the problems of this area. Because we gynecologists are stick to this area only. We are always in between the bladder, uterus, and rectum. Bladder, uterus, and rectum. So we have to understand the anatomy, especially in a detail. And you explain all the points in detail very nicely. Thank you, Dr. Sandhya. So now, Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. And now it's over to Dr. Arjuna uh, uh, for, to introduce the next speaker. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I thank Dr. Geeta for making such a great program. And on this Saturday, I, I, it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Jubin Dev Sharma to give his lecture on anorectal physiology. He is the consultant in gastroenterology and hepatology. And he has had gold medals both immediate and Delhi. He has done DNB, gastroenterology and hepatology, and is at the School of Digestive and Hepatobiliary Science in Nikanta Medicine. So I invite Dr. Jubin to give his lecture on anorectal physiology, which is very complex. And we all would like to gain uh, knowledge from you about the anorectal physiology, which is so important for the anorectal continence as well as uh, uh, incontinence. So over to Dr. Juvin Dev Sharma, sir. Thank you to the uh, chairpersons. And I want to thank Dr. Geeta and the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak on a topic which I am uh, very passionate about the anorectal physiology as well as the anorectal manometries and all the disorders that you know we routinely see. So uh, I will be very brief and I will try to stick to the point. Uh, and I was told to be uh, very uh, you know uh, basic in our physiology, and I'll try to be as much as it is possible. So uh, Dr. Salvador was you know a very famous urologist, and we have read a lot of his books. And he famously said that it's not sufficient to describe an anatomical structure. He said that the real answer should be that what is it for? And that is where the physiology of the inorectal area becomes much more important and much more relevant in our today's era. So this has been studied since the 19th century and you know, various complex uh, pathways have been explained, but till date, we still have some knowledge gaps on trying to identify what exactly physiology it really works, but we will still have some understanding now. More so because we have developed over a period of time from the last two decades, particularly, and Dr. And Dr. Shrihari has also seen this happening, is that right from the basic manometries, we now have high definition or 3D reconstruction uh, you know, available to us, which helps us to understand the normal thing first and eventually the abnormal things. So anatomy has been very well described by the by the my previous like uh, you know speaker and uh, I I don't think I can add any much any more to that and uh, we'll I'll directly go on to our physiology part. So what are the two basic functions that an inorectal area really entails? There are two basic functions. One is maintaining the continence 
and second thing is our defecation reflex and our whole lecture today will be focused on trying to understand how these two mechanisms actually occur so when we talk about maintaining the continence it's very a simple concept that you know uh, we know when we have to pass our stools but technically and physiologically we still don't know how it exactly happens over the years there have been various theories right from 1965 when we thought it's only the inner sphincter muscles that is that is you know creating an area of high pressure zone ultimately in 75 we thought it is the puborectalis muscle causing the angle finally you know we have come across now to something called as an integral theory where we understand that it is the principally how the ligaments and the muscles of the inner rectal area they work together in harmony under the control of the various neural centers both at the cerebral cortex and the spinal level under the influence of various hormones and the reflexes so this works not only for our bowel or the inner rectal it also works for urethra and the urinary bladder so the integral theory try to you know incorporate a common anatomical function and theory which says that both urethra or the urinary you know uh, flows and the inner rectal area they work together and the primary work is done by the ligaments and the muscles all you know together and if i really explain simply muscles controlled by the ligaments to control two tubes tubes being the anus and the urethra to open them or close them when i mean open it means defecation when i mean close it means maintaining the continence so in basic principle in a very basic state it is the whole of the control of the ligaments and the muscles to control our two tubes and that is what the function of an inner rectal area is now slightly more in detail how it actually happens the first concept of maintaining the continence it it has multiple factors in our play right from the inner rectal angles the inner cushions then the sensory function or the proprioception of or the mechanical stretch of the rectum itself the rectal reservoir function or the sigmoid storage function the compliance the high amplitude pressure waves coming down from the descending colon and finally the anatomical factors like the sphincters the high pressure zone and to some extent it also depends on what kind of stool is coming down the gi tract the first i'll talk about some anatomical angles we all have very well understood the role of the puborectalis it is one of the most important factors in maintaining the continence it creates this inner rectal angle which is approximately 90 degrees in its in, in its usual position it is contracted and when it you have to pass the motion it becomes more relaxed it becomes rectum almost becomes straight like a tube but normally to maintain the continence it is in a contracted state so the angle becomes from 90 to more obtuse when we are trying to pass the stools and this is a schematic representation of the same thing and what i am trying to explain next the sphincters we have we talked about the internal and the external sphincters in the anatomy class but if you understand this that you know by various means by understanding the balloon catheter by perfusions and solid state manometry what we have understood is that the internal inner sphincter actually contributes around 50 to 70% of the resting tone 15 to 20% is there by from the puborectalis and from the external inner sphincter and approximately 5% by the inner cushions or the hemorrhoidal plexus and it is due to intrinsic local myogenic activity and but whenever there is an increase in intraabdominal pressures by any cause whether you have a tumor ascites you have you're doing a valsalva maneuver the these accessory muscles start working more and more and they increase their contribution towards maintaining the continence from 5 to 10% to almost 25% and also in cases of obstetric injuries in cases of post hemorrhectomy injuries you know and we also get patients who are from middle east and who are from central asia who who have some blast injuries in the perineum we see that the sphincter actually is lost so these accessory muscles start to take you know with time they overcome the uh, their function of from 5 to almost 20% next come the role of the sensory function of the rectum itself it is this is something which is very very important to understand as soon as stool you know your rectum or the anal canal has to know in very simple means whether it is stool coming down 
it is liquid coming down or is it gas coming down until it knows what is coming down it can you know uh, you know we can give rise to incontinence so there are two principal reflexes one is called an racr or the recto anal contraction reflex and one is an rair which is much more important called the recto anal inhibitory reflex as soon as something comes down and it touches the internal sphincter the internal sphincter relaxes that is called as an rair and in some patients it's there is a very momentary racr just prior to an rair the rair or recto anal inhibitory reflex is very very important for something of a for called as an anal sampling the anal canal will actually sample what is coming down it will try to know if it is flatus it will your body will know it is you know flatus if it is stool your body will know it is stool so once it identifies then it proceeds further and what to do with it so there are mechanical receptors on the rectum itself and how much volume well the first perception when we do our and you know for all of us who do the anal manometries we know that the first perception usually comes somewhere around 20 30 40 mls and uh, the first you know uh, feeling of passing stool somewhere comes around 90 ml or 100 ml and the maximum tolerable volume can vary from 200 to almost 300 in my practice it's around 250 ml 300 where i see that they usually have a maximum tolerable volume so any factors that alters the ability to know of the rectum and the what is coming down can give rise to your anal incontinence so what are the once you have identified the local receptors what are the pathways across pathways are principally either you have from the internal sphincter you go to the l5 from the other areas from the external sphincter and from the local muscles you go to the preganglionic parasympathetic the sacral plexus s2 3 4 these reflexes are important again for maintaining your continence so we have to know that spinal cord plays very important role in cases of sacral injuries in cases of patients who have spinal cord problems these patients will have both urinary as well as you know anal in, uh, incontinence so what is the reservoir so it basically your rectum and your sigmoid colon they they work together in a unison to create a reservoir because not every time we can actually pass a motion when we feel to so almost 200 to 300 ml of volumes can actually be maintained in the sigmoid colon walls of houston or the retrograde low amplitude contractions from the rectum in towards the sigmoid colon can actually work and the inorectal angle that was initially we described with the puborectal is also helps to move the stool back into the sigmoid colon whenever we need it to be so this area becomes the reservoir to keep the stool in place until we are in a socially appropriate place where we are able to pass the stools locally of the anal canal itself we talk about the surgical tube there are some neural activities that we identify on manometry these are slow waves or the ultra slow waves this is normal they can give from anything from 1 to 3 cycles per minute to they can go on to almost 16 to 18 and this is important because post surgically whenever our surgeon colleagues they create an anastomosis we usually say what i usually say is these waves change their behavior and some of them develop a transient incontinence and when i identify these waves i know that this patient is going to develop the continence back after a few months so i know how what is their natural history post a surgical anastomosis so locally these normal waves are important so finally we what we also see this is a combination of what i have just described you that we have the the lumbar you know spinal cord l5 level which from the hypogastric nerves it controls the local rectum area after the rectum has told about the receptors and finally it maintains the continence from this uh, you know from the somatosensory path phase while being totally under the control of the cerebral cortex once we have understood of all we, uh, how the anal continence is there it has the anatomical factors sensory factors angle and the local you know reflexes we move on to how actually defecation takes place it principally involves four phases one is a basal phase one is a pre expulsive phase and one uh, you know uh, is expulsive phase and finally the end phase the pre expulsive phase can actually be 
you know described in two different time periods the basal phase is basically getting ready to pass motion so your resting inner tone is still maintained your colon is getting ready it ident it does the inner sampling it identifies okay it is a stool it is not anything else coming down from the gi tract it will begin the pre expulsive phase once it begins the pre expulsive phase you will have high amplitude propagating contractions hapcs which start from the descending colon and it move distally that is towards the anal canal and it brings the stool down into the rectum which increases the which causes the distension of the rectum itself and you have approximately 200 volume coming down in the rectum then you feel the urge okay now i have now i have to pass the motions once it happens uh, you know you will uh, your uh, signal goes up towards your cerebral cortex whether uh, you know you can actually pass or not and if you agree you, you are in a socially acceptable place you begin the expulsive phase the internal sphincter relaxes the pelvic floor musculature changes the puborectalis becomes more obtuse and we voluntarily relax the external sphincter and you pass the motions down and finally after we have passed the motions you begin the end phase in the end phase everything comes back to its normal resting position the external sphincter you know it's the first one to come back to its tonal position then the internal sphincter then the puborectalis and all the musculature of the you know rectal area so in very very brief step one is the distension step two is the stretch receptors locally in the rectum stool comes down local reflexes in the step three you will see after the local stretch has taken place it can be either uh, appro socially appropriate place or not depending on that you will have the local reflexes and you finally relax your sphincters um, very briefly in a, in a socially appropriate place, you will allow the defecation reflex by the pelvic nerves. And finally, it causes the contraction of the rectum. It's, how does the contraction takes place? The abdominal muscles, when you exert down, it will create pressure anteriorly and laterally. So it will cause the rectum to become like a slit like It will squeeze the motion down towards the inner canal. And finally, your internal sphincter relaxes and it moves down. In a not suitable condition, even if the, the rectum squeeze is there, your inner canal will not open. The internal sphincter will not relax because your cerebral cortex is, called, is saying not to relax. And this is where the principle of dysenergic defecation also comes back. With over a period of years, patients who keep on, you know, holding on, and particularly young kids who keep on holding this tool, they will develop that the, this habit of not relaxing their sphincter and the, well, they will keep pushing on their uh, motion down and they will not be able to pass the stools. So finally, uh, this is how the basic defecation takes place. But I will, you know, uh, I will also uh, agree and I will also try to give this that there are knowledge gaps in our physiology. There are a lot of things which we still do not understand that how does all these pan-colonic pressurization actually work? What is the role of the rectosigmoid break? There is a concept of a rectosigmoid break that the rectum or sigmoid can actually move the stool back into the descending colon if it has to. And you know, how does the colonic motility actually works immediately post you have passed your you know, stools. So to conclude, uh, I just want to say that it's a complex process. I have tried to make it as simple as possible, but it is still partly understood. There are some knowledge gaps in place, but for a practical standpoint, from a surgeon's you know, uh, frame point from a gastroenterologist frame point, we must understand the integral concept. So integral concept simply means your ligaments and muscles work together. Your ligaments are very, very, very important. If you have at extremes of age that elderly is your ligaments are weak, post perineal injury, your ligaments are the first one to get injured. If those are injured, you will not be able to control your splinter, the tubes, that is the urethra and the inorectal area, and you will have ultimately a lot of difficulties including incontinence and or on the other extreme difficulty in passing stools so thank you and uh, if there are any questions i'm happy to take it rajmi ma'am have you joined us ma'am yeah. uh, first of all i would like to congratulate dr geeta for choosing such an excellent topic. 
uh, topic for today's say CME. As, as a fellow, I've always found the posterior compartment to be most challenging. And uh, both the speakers, Dr. Sandhya Jain and Dr. Zubin, have so wonderfully and in an exhaustive way made such a difficult, uh, seem, seemingly such a difficult topic so easy to understand for all the, uh, for all the listeners. Uh, there is one thing that I've always believed in, that to be able to diagnose a condition and to be able to appropriately manage a patient, what is of utmost importance is to understand the anatomy and physiology of that particular part. And this has been done so wonderfully by both the speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Most welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jopin, for your uh, great presentation. And I thank uh, Dr. Ranjana, Dr. Ashna, Dr. Chandra, and Dr. Karishma for uh, joining us today and for uh, sparing their valuable time for our webinar. Thank you, sir, and thank you, all the chairpersons. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, moving on to the session two. Uh, in this session, we'll have uh, one lecture on the role of anorectal manometry in the assessment of patient with anorectal disorder, and then we'll have a case-based uh, scenario discussion. And uh, to chair the session, I would like to invite Dr. Vijay Arora, sir. Sir is a pioneer of uh, surgery in our hospital. He uh, he is chairman Department of General Episcopal Surgeon and Professor Gripme, Sir Gangara Hospital, in Delhi. Dr. J. P. Sharma. Sir is a great academist and currently working as a professor at Ames, New Delhi. He has been awarded Dr. B.C. Rai Award by Honorable President of India in 2015. And uh, we all know, we all, uh, he's a known face and he has published multiple papers and uh, chaired session in various national and international conferences. And Dr. Geeta, uh, our very own Dr. Geeta Mandiratta, ma'am, and then Dr. Monica Gupta, ma'am. Ma'am, Dr. Monica Gupta is professor at VMMC in Satvajam Hospital, New Delhi. Areas of interest are urinary and critical care obstetrics. Uh, she is a secretary OGD and had been secretary in RG Delhi from 2018 to 2020. I welcome you all. And I request Dr. Geeta, uh, ma'am, to please invite the speaker, Dr. Srihari Anikendi, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rebuka. Uh, am I audible? Hello? Yes, ma'am, you are. Yeah. So I would, uh, uh, Dr. Vijay Arora will be joining us shortly. He's stuck in the jam. So it gives me a great honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Shri Hari. He's a cracked set of information. He is too good and very brilliant gastroenterologist of Gangara, star in our firmament. He is working in the Institute of Liver Gastroenterology and Pancreatic Biliary Sciences at Gangara Hospital. And his special interest is in luminal gastroenterology, GI motility, manometry, and biofeedback. He is extremely well versed with the various diagnostic and therapeutic procedures, including endoscopy, colonoscopy, endoscopic ultrasonography, endoscopy, entroscopy, ERCP, etc. And I mean, all the high power uh, investigative modalities. And uh, he has an excellent exposure himself to office hepatology and liver and GI intensive care. So, Dr. Srihari, the floor is all yours. Please teach us. Uh, gynecologist, this very new topic, new kid on the block about this. What is anorectal manometry, first of all, and what is its role in assessment of patient with anorectal disorders? Dr. Shri, please. Yeah, thank you so much, ma'am. I think that was a very generous introduction, much more than what uh, it actually is. So if you allow me, I can please share my screen. Are my slides visible, ma'am? Yes, 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 they are. Shri, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. So uh, after the two brilliant lectures by the previous speakers, uh, the topic that has been allotted to me is the role of anorectal manometry in the assessment of anorectal disorders. And I'm extremely thankful to AOGD, 
and especially Dr. Geeta to give me this opportunity to present on this unique platform. I think it is the need of the hour that we do have a multidisciplinary approach to most of these problems that we routinely face, but uh, due to the lack of complete knowledge about these things, uh, we are usually stuck. So I'd like to give justice to this topic in the next 25 minutes or so, where I would like to, uh, uh, I mean, inform you all in the, in the most basic of uh, nature, what exactly is a manometry and what is the role of anorectal manometry in the assessment of anorectal disorders. So basically manometry, uh, we have been having it since a long period of time uh, uh, in clinical practice. So manometry is a functional test. The most of the tests that we have in practice are based on diagnosing structural problems. And we have very few tests which actually focus on functionality uh, of the organs in question. So manometry is one such test which measures the intraluminal pressure and also judges the coordination of pressure activity between the various muscles. There are manometry systems available for anorectum, the esophagus, anterodiodenum, and colon. But in clinical practice, anorectal manometry and esophageal manometry is that what is most commonly used. Anterodiodenal and colonic manometries are still not very popularly available and they are still in the research phase. Our previous speaker, Dr. Zubin, has now started also doing anterodiodenal manometry at Midanta and we'd like to hear from his experience in the future. So what is the principle of manometry? So the basic principle of manometry is that it, it gives us information about the peristalsis or the contraction occurring in the various parts of the body. So the initial research was, that was done in manometry was done for the esophagus. So suppose if this is the esophagus, this is the manometric catheter which has been placed in C2 and the yellow things that you see here are the channels in the, the manometric catheter. Now, when you talk of high resolution manometry, which is now the norm, it only means that the channels which are, which are assessing the pressure activity are placed very closely. So the activity that you see is quite close to each other and it is as good as seeing something on a high definition TV where the images are very crisp and you have high definition images. So initially you had line diagrams like this, where you could see where the pressure changes were occurring. But eventually the researchers thought that we should do something better with this. So they came up with something called as a Klaus plot. So Klaus plot, what it basically does, it has assigned colors, different colors, to various pressures which is occurring during any contraction or any activity which is going on in the areas of study. So the activity which is actually going on in the esophagus, suppose for example, it is a peristaltic wave which is starting from the tricopharynx and going all the way down. But you also have to realize that this activity is going on in a three-dimensional format. So how do you pictureize this three-dimensional uh, pressure activity that is going on in a two dimensional screen, because what we can see on a monitor is in two dimensions. We cannot assess it in three dimensions. So what they did is they gave it colors. So whenever you see any manometric image, you would be seeing a set of different colors. Now you have to realize that there are warm colors and there are cool colors. So warm colors are red and black or purple. And you have yellow which is in the moderate range and then you have cool colors which are basically blue and green so the areas which are showing you warm colors are the pressure are the areas where there is high pressure zones and the cool colors are the areas where the pressure zone where the pressure that is occurring is less so to come to a basic manometry system this is how a simple a basic manometry system looks like this is a water perfused manometry system we have two types of manometry systems one is the water perfused and one is a solid state system. The water perfused manometry systems are very cheap and they're routinely available and in India, in most of the centers, what you have is a water perfused manometry and it, and it gives us decent information uh, uh, as compared to a solid state manometry catheter, which looks something like this. A solid state manometry catheter, the only advantage is that it is easier to install and apply because for a water perfuse system, you have to do a lot of juggling uh, to set the system into place. But if you have trained technicians, you have a trained unit, that is not a problem. 
The disadvantages of a solid state system is that it is extremely expensive, it is very fragile, and only a limited number of cases can be done with this. So for practical reasons, most of the centers in India, uh, almost 99% of the centers in India would be having a water perfused manometry system. So how does a water perfused manometry system basically work? So the, the heart of the manometry system is a chamber which contains water in a water perfused system. So this water is being propelled under pressure because of a gas coming out through one of the tubings. This is usually air or nitrogen. So this gas is being propelled, uh, is propelling this water across these various tubings and the pressures we can see on the screen. These tubings are then connected and you can regulate the pressure. Uh, a PSI is set and you can regulate this pressure and these, this, this water is then flowing through this intricate system of capillaries and channels which are then connected to a single catheter. You can see that water coming out through these catheter through the various channels that are present in this catheter. Now this catheter is then inserted into the area of interest. Suppose it is uh, the, uh, the anorectal manometry would be inserting this into the anorectum. This is the esophageal manometry would be inserting this in the esophagus. And whatever pressure comes across to the flow of water across this channel, that is reflected in the form of colors on the graph. So that is how a manometry system actually works. So in an anorectal manometry, this is how the positioning of the patient, patient is. The best part of an anorectal manometry is that it does not require any pre-procedural, uh, uh, any pre-procedural workup, any pre-procedural, you know, uh, uh, evacuating the stools. You don't require anything major. The only thing that is required is that you do a PR examination and rule out that there is any fecal loading in the rectum. If that is the case, an enema is given half an hour prior to the procedure, and you can do the procedure. The patient does not have to be fasting. The, the procedure is absolutely painless, it is very easy, and it is very well tolerated by the patient, so the acceptability is very high. So the catheter has been inserted through the rectum, and the investigator or the patient also can see these screens and see the various colors and graphs that are playing on the screen. We, we have a, a separate screen for the patient because this is useful in conditions where we do a biofeedback therapy for this patient, where the patients are as much involved as the investigator is during his course of treatment. So when we are doing an anorectal manometry, the catheter has been placed into the anorectum around five to 10 centimeters inside. And the tip of the catheter is somewhere in the rectum. There are multiple channels as we saw. This shows the position of the channels inside the rectum and the anal canal area. And usually we have a balloon at the tip of the catheter, which is useful in performing certain maneuvers, especially in doing the anorectal manometer. So now that we have inserted this catheter in the anorectum, at rest, we know that there is no pressure in the rectum, but the sphincters are contracted at rest. So you can see here, at in the rectum, the pressures are negligible, zero to six, Whereas in the sphincter, it has a tone of itself, it is contracted at rest and you see warmer color. So you see a, a pressure in the anal canal of around 50 to 60 millimeters of mercury. So once you place the catheter in C2, you perform various maneuvers. Now these maneuvers have now been standardized with a recent paper published. This is called as the London classification. Previously, it was being done at various centers, but there was no standardization. Now, because of the increased awareness, the increased utility of these manometry techniques, uh, we have now tried to standardize things. So after you place the catheter, you give a time of stabilization to the patient for around three minutes. Then there is, uh, you do recordings at rest. Then you do three squeezes. You ask the patient to voluntarily squeeze his sphincter. Then you do an endurance squeeze, which is a long squeeze, which is lasting for 30 seconds. Then you ask the patient to cuff and see the changes on the graph. You ask the patient to then push out the balloon and see the changes on the graph. Then as Dr. Zubin had discussed about RAIR, you try to elicit the recto-anal inhibitory reflex. Then you check for the sensations in the rectum. And the last thing that is done is the balloon expulsion test. I'll discuss about these individual maneuvers in detail. So in the resting anal pressure, this is how a resting anal pressure is seen. The anal sphincter is showing some pressure, the rectum is showing negligible pressure. 
Now, what this tells us, basically the resting anal tone, as we know, as Dr. Zubin had discussed, the internal anal sphincter contributes to around 60% of the tone of the resting anal tone. The external anal sphincter contributes around 30% and the hemorrhoidal plexus gives us around 10% to the resting anal tone. So basically what you are seeing here is predominantly the activity of the internal anal sphincter. It is seen that the maximum resting anal sphincter in women is less than in men. The average resting anal sphincters in females is around 50 millimeters of mercury and in men is around 60 millimeters of mercury. As we grow in age, the resting anal sphincter pressures decrease. So it is very likely that in elderly people, your resting anal tones are quite low as compared to a, a younger person. Now this year you can see the previous uh, graph had shown you resting anal pressures which were in the red zone. Here you see they have become black. So the pressures are much more higher. So this is a patient who has a high resting anal pressure. So this is usually seen in conditions like anal fissure or whenever you have a smooth or a striated muscle spasm like in proctitis. Conditions which we uh, view as gynecologists would be more interested, is, uh, interested in is usually you would like you would see patients who have a low resting anal pressure. This is usually seen in OAC or uh, road traffic accidents in post anorectal surgery patients and in elderly patients with comorbidities. Then comes the anal squeeze. You ask the patient to squeeze his finger. So when the patient is squeezing, he is adding on the activity of the external anal sphincter. The internal anal sphincter is involuntarily, involuntary in nature and the external anal sphincter is under our voluntary control. So whenever you ask the patient to squeeze, you are actually checking the, the integrity of his external anal sphincter, which is controlled by the somatic nerves. So it is seen that the squeeze pressure in women is also low in, uh, as compared to males, and it is low in older as compared to younger people. The average squeeze pressure in females is around 100 to 130 millimeters of mercury. In men, it is higher. It is around 120 to 200 millimeters of mercury. Low squeeze pressures can be seen in obstetric trauma, like OAC, RTA, uh, post anorectal surgery, elderly patients with comorbidities, almost similar uh, conditions as uh, previously. Uh, there are a few patients with history of ex uh, sexual abuse who show low squeeze pressures. High squeeze pressures can be seen in uh, conditions with chronic pelvic pain. The next thing that we see is a cuff reflex. So basically, it is a protective reflex. So whenever you cuff, your intra-abdominal pressures increase. And so you don't want anything seeping out from the rectum because the rectal cavity is in continuum with the abdominal cavity. So whenever there is an increase in the intra-abdominal pressures, there is a rise in the rectal pressures. And so naturally, there is a tendency that something might leak out. So you have a natural uh, protective mechanism called as a cuff reflex, which leads to a contraction of the sphincter when, when the intra-abdominal pressures are rising. So what you see in this graph, this is the baseline rectal pressure. The patient has cuffed and you see a sudden spike in the rectal pressures, but whenever there has been a spike in the rectal pressures at the same time, you see that the pressures in the sphincter have also increased and so the sphincters have now closed shut. So increased intra-abdominal pressure should cause a reflux sphincter contraction. So this helps us to check the integrity of a reflex arc. So this reflex arc is basically a local reflex arc, which is arising from the rectal musculature and going through the sympathetic uh, through the sacral nerve, the S1 to S5 segment of the Zubin discussed. So it is useful, especially in patients with incontinence. So if you have a absent cuff reflex, it indicates that there is a defect in the sacral reflex arc, that is a local reflex arc. If you have a normal cuff reflex and you have a normal squeeze pressure, you, it is a normal finding. But in, in a few patients where you can find a normal cuff reflex, but the squeeze pressures are low, the defect is not in the local reflex arc, but it is somewhere above it. The defect is in the central motor pathway above the sacral segments of the spinal cord. The next reflex that we seek for is a rectoanal inhibitory reflex. So you, I showed you the balloon that was present in the rectum. So in this reflex, what we do is that we inflate the rectal balloon suddenly with air. So whenever there is air in the balloon, you see the rectal pressure slightly rising here. Whenever there is a sudden increase uh, in the rectal pressure, there is a relaxation which occurs in the anal sphincter. Uh, this is a natural reflex which helps us in evacuation. So this sphincter relaxation has to be documented. Now this is extremely useful in small, in young children 
especially you come to you with chronic constipation and you're suspecting hirschsprung disease what happens in hirschsprung disease is that the local myentary plexus is affected so when you have an affection of the myentary plexus in the rectum uh, the autonomic nervous system in rectum is affected this rair is absent is lost so if you can document that rair is present hirschsprung is ruled out with a very very high specificity so this is an excellent test in children with whom we suspect hirschsprung disease if you have an absence of rair it might mean hirschsprung it might not mean hirschsprung it might mean that patient might have a, a previous surgery a post circular myotomy which is affecting this nerves at this area or a lar which is affecting at this area when the amount of volume which is required is higher normally we can elicit rair with as little as 15 mm of uh, 15 ml of air in the rectum or 50 ml of air in the rectum if you require much higher volumes of air to elicit rair uh, it could possibly be a mega rectum or a chagas disease in a few patients you see a rebound contraction uh, or a rect an exaggerated racr or recto anal contractile reflex which can be seen in anal fissures or in a few patients with myotonic dystrophy the next maneuver that is done is the rectal sensory testing so we keep on inflating the balloon in the rectum by small increments and maximal distension is around 400 ml and three sensations are tested when do you get the first sensation when you get the desire to defecate and at what point does the patient get the urgency the point at which he just cannot stop any further and has to go immediately to the loo so these are the averages that is see, the average uh, sensations that uh, that we see in normal practice this basically helps us in finding about the compliance of the rectum how good is in rectum Uh, in the terms of a capacitance organ is it able to hold a lot of amount of uh, content like stool or is it low less capacious so increased sensation also called as rectal hypersensitivity would be seen in inflammatory conditions like proctitis where the, there is inflammation in the rectum now irritable bowel syndrome is known to have something known as visceral hypersensitivity where the patients tend to you know uh, perceive their sensations much more and visceral hypersensitivity is shown to have a good correlation with rectal hypersensitivity so if you are documenting rectal hypersensitivity in a patient who has come to you with chronic constipation it is very likely that you are dealing with a patient who has ibs an increased sensation would also be present in urge fecal incontinence i'll come to that in a few studies rectal hyposensitivity is possibly because of a defecatory disorder where the patient keeps retaining his stools in the rectum which eventually leads to a loss of the local neurons leading to secondary hyposensitivity and possibly might lead to a mega rectum in future the important the last and the second last or the most important maneuver that we usually do is is called as a simulated defecation where the balloon has been inflated in the rectum and you are asking the patient to bear down or to try to push the balloon out a normal defecation it involves an increase in the rectal pressure obviously considering the physiology you would want your rectal pressures to be high but at the same time you want your anal sphincters to be relaxed so that whenever you are trying to push out the stools the rectal pressure increases and the sphincter opens up so that the stool passes out so this is a normal graph that you would see where the patient is pushing the rectal pressures are rising and you see a complete relaxation of the anal sphincter so based on this test we can diagnose something called as anorectal dyssynergy so what happens in anorectal dyssynergy is there is a incoordination between the increase in the rectal activity and the relaxation of the anal sphincter so you have basically four types of anorectal dyssynergy in clinical practice in type 1 anorectal dyssynergy it is seen that the rectal pressures are rising but at the same time the sphincter pressures are also rising so the patient is not able to expel out in type 2 dyssynergy what you see is that the rectal pressures are not rising enough usually you need around 40 mm of mercury pressures in the rectum to push it out you don't have an adequate increase in the rectal pressures but you also have a paradoxical increase in the anal pressures so this is detrimental in type 3 dyssynergy you have an adequate increase in the rectal pressure but there is no relaxation you also need a relaxation in the sphincter so that things move out there is no relaxation here in type 4 dyssynergy there is no increase in the rectal pressures and there is no relaxation in the anal sphincter 
factor. So this is how these four types of dyssynergy are seen on classified in clinical practice. The last test that is done is a balloon expulsion test where you actually ask the patient to push out the balloon and give him around one minute to three minutes to push that balloon completely out. You ask the patient to do that in privacy. It can be done in lateral, but the best way to do it is in a sitting position. It is sometimes done with a weight. Um, the Mayo Clinic does it with around 200 grams fully. And you can do it with or without a gentle traction and give it one minute and you ask the patient to push it out within one minute. So basically with all these manoeuvres, the use of manometry is in these conditions. One, it is used in refractory constipation. It is used in diagnosis, uh, including for Hirschsprung disease in children, as well as for therapy of refractory constipation, like for biofeedback. It is useful in fecal incontinence, where it is used for diagnosis of uh, low sphincter pressures. It is also used for therapy uh, for biofeedback. It is useful in anorectal pain syndromes as a diagnostic aid and in some cases also as treatment for biofeedback for levator ani syndrome. It is useful for preoperative evaluation in cases where there is you are suspect you are you want a reversal of stoma or for a fissure surgery. And for gynecologists, it is especially useful to check for anorectal integrity, especially when you suspect an OH. In clinical practice, the most important uh, indications for an anorectal manometry is for refractory constipation and for fecal incontinence. Yeah, so for uh, anorectal manometry in constipation, so uh, we had discussed this in, uh, in slide. I will just go through the basics. So when there is an evacuation of stool involved, when you're thinking of constipation, the problem could be a two point. One is in the beginning, the stool uh, is propelled from aborat from the cecum down towards the rectum. So the problem could be the there is a problem with the aboral propulsion of the stools from the cecum towards the rectum. So this is something called as a slow colonic transit, which is diagnosed on the basis of colonic transit study. The next step that occurs is that once the stool comes, it comes and sits into the rectum. It is not that you're continuously passing stools you have your rectum filling up before you actually pass the stools out. So rectum is basically a capacious reservoir which stores the stools for a period of time. So rectal evacuation occurs when you have a coordinated increase in the rectal pressures and a decrease in the anal sphincter pressures which helps in the rectal evacuation. Now, if there is a problem at this stage, so when there is no coordination between the increase in the uh, rectal pressure, or the decline in the sphincter pressure, that is when you are dealing with a fecal evacuation disorder or an anorectal dyssynergy. So basically, your anorectal manometry helps you or, uh, diagnose this problem, that is the stage of anorectal dyssynergy. So we have realized, as uh, previous researchers have also done, in the West, a slow colonic transit, that is the moment of colonic transit uh, is slightly slow, is, is in around 50% of the patients. And paradoxical anal contraction is also seen in significant number of patients. In our experience, in Indians, the slow colonic transit is not very common. It might be in one in, three, one in four or even one in five because we have a good amount of fiber in our diet. The most common cause of constipation in our subset of population is this energy. So we have found it to be very prevalent in around 50 or 60% of the patients. In anal incontinence, how does anorectal manometry help us? Low basal pressures are seen, especially in patients with, who have passive incontinence. In low squeeze pressures can be seen in urge incontinence. You also see rectal hypersensitivity very frequently in patients with fecal incontinence because the rectal sensations are low. And this reduces the rectal compliance. It reduces its capacity to hold stools for a long period of time. And so there is a bowel movement which helps it expel. So you have fecal incontinence in this first case. Uh, Dr. Vijay Roda is there and uh, there is something called as a LAR syndrome. So LAR syndrome is a low anterior resection. Post an LAR, it is seen that many people land up with fecal incontinence and studies have shown us that it is not just the redu reduction in the pressures of the sphincter which is adding to that, but most importantly, it is also the changes in the sensation of the rectum, the decrease in the compliance of rectum, which actually lead to LAR syndrome. So basically, we can treat those aspects of the problems uh, rather than just focusing on the sphincter. Now, functional anorectal pain syndrome is one other important point where manometry helps. There are three 
functional anorectal pain syndrome which actually uh, which we encounter in practice one is the proctalgia you get a levator anise syndrome and a functional anorectal pain so a patient with proctalgia fugax usually has a very sharp pain in the rectum which lasts hardly for a few seconds or for a few minutes it is very intermittent in nature and when you do a pr examination or a manometry they are absolutely normal so biofeedback might not have any role in such cases uh, in a levator anise syndrome the pain is dull in nature it lasts for a very long period of time it is usually chronic when you do a pr examination usually you find a rectal tenderness in such cases and on manometry you are able to document around anorectal dyssynergy in around 70% of this patient so this is useful because we should be able to target this by doing a biofeedback which might lead to an improvement in most of these patients a functional anorectal pain syndrome is similar to a levator anise syndrome except that you won't elicit any rectal tenderness on a pr examination and a role of manometry in such cases is questionable so Uh, ARM is also useful in preoperative assessment of anorectal disorders. Dr. Vijayaroda is a very keen proponent of this, and he does manometries for almost all his patients before we post them for surgery. So it is especially useful in patients with anal pressure to ascertain the anal pressures at baseline, and also to post objective, post operatively, objectively find how much change we were able to elicit. In patients in whom a reversal of ileostomy or colostomy is planned, we first confirm the adequacy of the anal squeeze. And the anorectal functional apparatus before we take those patients up for closure of uh, colostomy. Now, in patients with OAC, it is uh, anorectal manometry which is, uh, is is a useful parameter to decide if in the first pregnancy patient has had had an OAC whether it would be wise to go for a further vaginal de delivery in the oncoming oncoming pregnancies. So, uh, the two most important tests that are recommended in such cases is an endo anal ultrasound. and second is the anorectal manometry it is seen that vaginal delivery is still a viable option in more than 50% of the women after oac but should, but it is important uh, studies have shown us that there should be lack of fecal symptoms there should be no sphincter defects on the uh, uh, in the on the endo anal ultrasound and anorectal manometry should show you normal pressures in the sphincter now there are a lot of interesting things that line up that are lined up in the in this arena in the future one thing that is coming up very fast is a 3d anorectal manometry now this gives you images actually in three dimensions and makes it easier for you as physicians and for the patients also to understand what actually is going around so here you see two patients so this was the original graph that we discussed here you can see it in three dimensions here the patient is at rest where the sphincters are closed when you are squeezing the anal sphincters are tightly closed when you are pushing or defecating the sphincters have opened up and the passage can occur but if you have a patient who has dyssynergia when the patient is trying to push out what actually is happening is that there is a contraction at the sphincter area and obviously this patient will land up with constipation there is also something called as functional luminal impedance probe which is coming up this is still in the early stages and we might see it more often in the future and this could be the future that of manometry uh, in uh, in the coming time so my take home message is that anorectal manometry is an excellent test to make functional assessment of the anorectal apparatus it is safe easy to perform with very good patient acceptability the anorectal manometry has a proven utility in chronic constipation especially in ods and ibs and query ibs and in fecal incontinence it is found to be useful in functional anorectal pain syndrome and oac the avenues for comprehensive multidisciplinary approach to this disorders are sparse and i think these are need of the hour and we should have such meetings more in future to uh, to uh, uh, grasp onto this knowledge thank you very much thank you dr shrihari that was a wonderful uh, informative information packed lecture and i welcome dr vijay arora sir who's a pioneer Uh, in this field sir we would love to have your uh, few comments yeah thank you geeta and uh, all your members of the uh, committee for giving me this opportunity i'm sorry i wasn't there right at the beginning as you had requested me to introduce but you took up that job very well dr shri hari has presented the concise functional anatomy and physiology of the anorectal Yeah. and uh, here i would just like to make two three comments 
one is that whenever there is a scientist telling us about all the details that dr shri hari is talking about and he is a wonderful scientist he has set up this lab and he is giving us the latest information on the various um, parameters that we want to know but the three things which we as clinicians have to recognize one there is a pure functional element which means on your and my examination of the pelvis or the anorectum there is no abnormality second is that there is a structural change which has happened it may be a fissure it may be a rectocele it may be just spastic um anal sphincter or there may be a patulous anal sphincter all these changes they give rise to one symptom and that is constipation with or without leakage at odd times and correction of the structural changes is as important as getting the function back because the change which has led to those structure alteration that needs to be corrected also the third is we are now looking at small fragments of a totality we are looking at anal sphincters we are looking at um pelvic floor as a whole we are looking at the urinary sphincters and the urinary function and we are looking at the basic causes which are two one is sphincteric hypertonia that leads to obstructive syndromes and obstructive defecation is the basic pathology which is there till now obstructive defecation has been defined as a nebulous term there is obstruction but what is causing the obstruction obviously it is the sphincters whether they don't relax whether they are spastic or there is some other malformation there has highlighted very much in detail the second is prolapse prolapse of the organ whether it is urinary bladder whether it is uh, uterus or it is the mucosa or whole of the rectum as such that gives rise to the basic structural changes which happen hello so prolapse and hypertonia if we can correct that the constipation will be taken care of the other part is incontinence incontinence has a different dimension altogether where there is destruction of either the sphincters themselves or the neural supply of it and they need to be repaired in a different way in the last um, session we uh, often talk about the uh, obstetric causes of sphincteric damage sphincter of the anal canal is not a single entity the center of the whole of the pelvis is the body pubic body where all the muscles are attached and that is damaged during an obstetric event and that leads to all the problems otherwise individually we have hypertonia or prolapse once we have corrected these two whether or not by uh, repeated application of mental energy which shri hari advises that the patients undergo training and biofeedback and understand their own problem but if there is a structural change 
it will need a structural operative procedure. So the very good pictures that Sri Hari showed at the end of the defecation, those are unfortunately not dynamic. Once we have dynamic pictures of actual prolapse, where it starts, how it comes, and what to do with it, whether it requires a repair or it requires a resection, we will get to know the exact thing which is needed to correct this. That one difficult, one small can, point. One difficult graphic tell you whether it's just a rectal mucosal prolapse or a whole rectum coming down, so that we can tailor our treatment. Yes, it does. Unfortunately. The two types of difficography which are available to us, one is X-ray, which gives us the inner dimension, but not the wall of the rectum. It does show prolapse coming down. It does show rectocele, whether anterior, posterior, or a combined. It does show all that. MRI is a much better modality to see the rectal wall. But MRI has one very big problem. Nobody, including you and I, can pass tool lying down on our left side. We have to be sitting. So MRI is now getting into a stage where an uh, open uh, MRI is available. And once we have a dynamic picture of the MRI showing where exactly is the obstruction, then we have. Obviously, we do a procedure called STAR for rectocele and um, internal rectal prolapse. But when STAR is done and the prolapse is too large, then it is inadequate. And if it requires a resection like Ultimire, that may be the next answer. But if it is the pelvic floor, which is bringing everything down, these procedures have no meaning. Then you have to have a call for suspension. Thank you. So Thank these are all the things which are... Uh, I, came which across, I came across two patients till date who had similar problems. They came with the severe problem, severe pain in their perineum. And they feel like passing stools. But when you do a PR, there is nothing in the rectum. So we got the MRI done and it showed that there is some internal prolapse. Uh, yes, can yes. these patients be operated and does the surgery give good results, sir? Because on PS examination, speculum examination, the vagina is absolutely normal. Absolutely. This is where the Srihari's lab comes into the picture. Yeah. See, I always explain to my patients what you are feeling from the urge to pass stool, the need to push something out, and what we are seeing may be two different things. If you divide the rectum as a room and the anal opening and the sphincter as the door, if the problem is in the door, which you bypass and go into the room and say room is clean. And the gastroenterologist also, unfortunately, the patients feel that they have a problem with passing stool, so they get a colonoscopy done. Colonoscopy is normal. It's normal, sir. So she kept on pushing her finger inside. Something is there. Something is there. These are only indicative that the room is clean. It is yeah. the door at fault. The door is studied by anal manometry. And Monal, you have to door. refer her. Yeah, yeah, now we know which place to refer. <laughs> and Dr. Monica, I welcome you. Monica, Monica is a very interesting. We go over some case based scenarios. Just one we will do now, Sri, and we will do the rest because the other speakers are in the line. Yeah, sure, sure. Very interesting case for you, Sri Hari. Please tell her, solve her problem. Monica, what is your case? Yeah. Uh, after this uh, mesmerizing description of uh, anal meltometry, Dr. Shrihari, I must compliment you for that and the beautiful summarization with, uh, by Dr. Vijay. Uh, I mean, we, we feel enriched. And just to add uh, a very small point, uh, what Sir was mentioning, uh, dynamic defecography, yes, definitely uh, that adds to the armamentorium and that's Im immensely helpful. 
I've had the fortune to witness a few uh, during my fellowship in UK. And believe you me, I mean, I, since that time I've come back, I've been looking for places where, you know, we, we can find these things in one go at one place and, you know, to develop a beautiful uh, multidisciplinary, uh, you know, unit kind of thing. So just to... Hi, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, that that's a definite eye opener for so many people today. But uh, yes, uh, even but sir, even you said the dynamic thing is uh, lacking still. <laughs> but I'm See, sure it'll get. The, uh, the MI gives you a dynamic uh, thing, but no. it is it gives you in spurts <laughs> that the patient yeah. is training. There is some. Um, um, you know, yes, some of that, the that defines the things line, very beautifully. M line that is changed. But Even the interception like. part, I noticed, you know, that is very beautifully cleared out uh, while uh, dynamic uh, defecography. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so just just to uh, reiterate the basics which uh, Dr. Srihari had told us, uh, for the benefit of the audience, uh, let us just uh, discuss it in the form of a case. So, uh, Dr. Srihari, we have a 55-year-old uh, postmenopausal female with chronic constipation for last 15 years. And uh, so hard she has tried. Uh, she has not been relieved of uh, taking multiple laxatives and she is now complaining of incomplete evacuation and she has to excessively strain. And uh, for whatever evaluation has been done previously, her blood investigations, her ultrasound and colonoscopy all have turned out to be normal. So in this scenario, I would uh, first like you to elaborate on, uh, you know, the, the realm of constipation, when exactly we call it refractory constipation, what does it mean? And when exactly it should be ideally evaluated? Yes. So uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so basically, when a patient comes to you with constipation, he might not always mean that he has heart speed. So for different people, constipation means different things. So it could be hard stools, it could be decrease in the stool frequency, it could be excessive straining, it could be a mixture of both. So for us as physicians, we usually always focus that what is the bowel moments, whether he's passing one stools every day, whether he's had very hard stools. So we usually tend to consider this as a patient who is coming to with constipation. But interestingly, the most common symptom that people with constipation come to you with is straining. So they always feel that they have to strain and they frequently feel that they have incompletely evacuated whenever they have gone to the loop. So it is not so easy. So this is just, I wanted to show you, this is one of the patients. He's a doctor in fact himself who just came to us maybe a month back and this was his, his symptoms. He was so frustrated and he had written this extensive paragraphs of symptoms that he was suffering from since last 20, 30 years. And no doubt there have been movies which have come up with this, this, you know, this problem of constipation. Why it seems to be an enigma despite so many years of us understanding the anorectal physiology and still not coming up, coming up with, you know, good ways to treat constipation. So as Dr. Vijayaroda very rightly said, a case of refractory constipation need not always mean a colonoscopy. In fact, if you just try to go back and find out how many patients with constipation have had an abnormal colonoscopy? I'm sure it would not have been more than, not even 0.5%. A colonoscopy does not give you any significant clinically relevant information to give you the cause of constipation. Yes, a colonoscopy is mandatory if the patient has some red flag signs. The red flag signs include if the patient is very elderly, if he has blood in his stools, if he has had weight loss, if he has decreased appetite, and things like that, that is when you should go in for a colonoscopy. For, but for patients who just come to you with constipation and no other alarm symptoms, um, a colonoscopy hardly has any role. So the American Journal of Gastroenterology way back in 2013 had told us that a patient who comes to you with chronic constipation, you should consider metabolic and structural evaluation and baseline. Start with a therapeutic trial with laxatives, and if there is inadequate response, the first test that should be done is an anorectal manometry and a balloon expulsion test, not a colonoscopy. This is the unfortunate thing that is practiced everywhere, a colonoscopy. Sir. The first test would be an anorectal manometry with a balloon expulsion test, and then we can add on colonic transit studies or an MR defecography and then reach to a, a, a clinically relevant conclusion. So in our patient, the, the one that we discussed, 
we did a anorectal manometry and as with many patients we find that this patient had an anorectal dysenergy so anorectal dysenergy because you see that when she is trying to expel her stool she is she is generating good amount of pressures in the rectum but at the same time if you see the sphincter pressures are much more than the pressures in the rectum so this patient had an anorectal dysenergy on the manometry added to that a failed balloon expulsion test a colonic transit study was normal rest of the anorectal parameters were normal so clearly she was a case of anorectal dysenergy and this is when we offered a biofeedback Great. so biofeedback is basically an operant conditioning technique this was described way back in 1987 for spastic pelvic floor syndrome so basically biofeedback is based on the concept of reinforcement so it is based on punishment or reinforcement when the patient is doing it right you you encourage the patient to keep doing that when the patient is doing it wrong you discourage the patient to stop doing that and start doing it in the right way so biofeedback do a patient uh, to do biofeedback what you need is either an anorectal manometry or you need a emg in most centers across the world it is done on anorectal manometry based technique we usually do four to six sessions for these patients every one to two weeks and total duration is around 1 to 2 months each session lasting for 30 to 45 minutes it can also be done on an opd based setting and in the us a home based manometry home based biofeedback is also very popular the patient can himself do it at home and see the the readings or the graph and correct himself accordingly there are three important steps that we uh, try to change and educate the patient when we tell them first is educate the patient regarding the normal defecation physiology it is very important to understand that there are something called as high amplitude peristaltic contractions which occur in the rectum now these hapcs which occur are, are, are most profound at two points in time one is when you wake up first thing in the morning and second when you have the first meal in the day so after you, uh, at these points in time you have a very good colonic urge to pass stools and you we instruct the patient to not miss out on those urges because the subsequent urges are not that strong the toilet sitting posture is very important i'll get back to you on that and also as teach the patient for abdominal breathing yes. exercises dr zubin had touched upon this so in defecation the colonic pro activity propels the luminal contents towards the rectum then the rectal filling occurs when rectum is filled there is a recto anal inhibitory reflux so the anal sphincter is relaxed so there is some seepage which occurs in the anus anal canal and the anal canal is able to sense ki what is coming down and it senses whether this is platelets or this is stools now if the defecation is convenient if you have a social environment where you are you should be able to defecate if it is yes you assume a suitable posture you relax your anal sphincter and there is a voluntary uh, straining and an involuntarily involuntary colorectal motor activity and that is when the expulsion actually occurs so the first thing that you should be aware is have, have the right toilet sitting posture so this is very very important so as already discussed the pubo rectalis plays a very important role in maintaining our continence it in when you are standing the pubo rectalis is in play so it is choking the rectum and not allowing stools to pass out okay now when you sit when you are sitting like this the pubo rectalis is slightly relaxed and the rectum the anorectal sphincter is slightly opened up the angle is slightly opened up and small passage can occur but when you are actually in a squatting position the pubo rectalis is completely relaxed and there is a complete straightening of the anorectal angle and that is when you are able to pass it efficiently so that is why it is important and it is already always told that our indian toilets are much better than western toilets for people who use western toilets we ask them to use squatty potty or a stool of 6 inch below their feet so that he can naturally assume this posture which actually helps in evacuation of the stool so this is one of the patient uh, uh, learning that we tell them next that we teach them with abdominal breathing so basically as i told you the uh, the rectal pressures that are generated are basically in continuum with the abdominal pressure and the better your abdominal breathing the better is the strength in your abdominal muscles the better is the rectal pressures that you can generate so to generate good rectal pressures you need to have good tone in the abdominal muscles and abdominal breathing exercises when it is that you teach the patient next is you identify and target the problem area specifically especially in patients who have a dysenergic defecation whether the problem actually lies with an ineffectiveness in the rectal propulsion whether there is a paradoxical contraction of the 
annual sphincter or there is an inadequate relaxation or there is something going wrong with the rectal sensation so if there is an ineffective rectal proportion a good toilet training posture helps breathing exercises help them a lot we teach them to breath hold in inspiration and tighten the muscles to bear down manometry helps us in localizing the sphincter so on the manometry when the patient is pushing down as we can see what is going on in this area they can also see that and then we teach them accordingly that this needs to change these pressures have to go down these pressures have to come up so that is how it is taught for impaired rectal sensation also it has been shown that manometry helps you so we use a rectal balloon distension at a volume that generates the first sensation and then go on gradually decreasing the volume to establish sensations at an appropriate volume at a lower volume but this has to be done repeatedly and eventually over a period of time some few patients do show a good response and then once you have done this the last step is reinforcement you do good maintenance and follow up sessions of these patients ask them to maintain a stool diary and ask them to come on follow up and keep seeing that they are doing it in the right way so this is that patient that we were discussing at baseline she was con continuously contracting her sphincters there was pressure in the rectum but the sphincters always seem to be contracted after four sessions of biofeedback we see that the rectal pressure sensations are still being rectal pressure generation is still being uh, done very well there is an excellent relaxation of the anal sphincters at this point of time and patient had substantial relief from her symptoms there have been multiple randomized controlled trials to show that biofeedback is an excellent technique for to to uh, to uh, help people with anorectal dysphagia i think we have short out out of time so i would be discussing just this yeah, one case uh, shri we i think we are short of time and we have a session at the end so sure. we can do the interactive continue the lectures there on and absolutely so much uh, may i request dr renuka now to start the session 3 there's a slight change thank you everybody and bye bye Uh, with this, we move towards our session three. In this session, we will talk about role of ultrasonog ultrasonography in patients with different endocrine disorders. And to chair the session, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Sonal Bhatla, ma'am. Ma'am is senior consultant in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology in Palpana Hospital, New Delhi. She is vice president, Society of Genital Surgeons of Delhi. and head and she is executive committee member of narchi dr umadani swan ma'am ma'am is senior consultant department of obstetrics and gynecology at max super specialty hospital sharimar bag new delhi her areas of interest are urogynecology and pelvic reconstructive surgery she has done she has organized about 15 urogyny live operative workshops at different hospitals in new delhi dr mala shrivastava ma'am Ma'am is senior consultant and professor Gurmeer at Sarangaram Hospital, New Delhi. She uh, she was past uh, she uh, she was past president AOGD and has been elected as vice president ICU for upcoming years. Dr. Nija Vashne, ma'am, she is senior consultant of Sangaini at uh, and she has been affiliated with different hospitals and uh, she was in charge of uh, maternal and child health at different and in different government hospitals and her areas of interest are endoscopy, urogyny, and fetal medicine i welcome you all and i request dr mala shivasta ma'am to please invite our speaker hence peter right sir first this is dr now uh, there is a little change in our program dr first dr good afternoon everyone talk about okay welcome ma'am please invite uh, sir for lecture good afternoon good afternoon everyone it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome dr hans peter Professor Hans Peter is an obstetrician gynecologist and certified subspecialist in urogynecology. He was born in Germany and graduated from Heidelberg University in 1988 obtaining an MD there in 1989. Between 1999 and 2002 he undertook urogynecology subspecialty training in Sydney and obtained a PhD with the University of New South Wales. Between 2008 and 2021 he was professor in obstetric and gynecology at Sydney Medical School University of Sydney Professor Hans Peters academic work focuses on childbirth related maternal pelvic floor trauma as well as antenatal and intrapartum concern he has authored 375 peer reviewed publications and 23 book chapters All the audience is eagerly waiting for your scientific deliberation, Professor. Please go ahead. 
Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, of course, I can't be in Delhi, but I'm in Springwood, New South Wales, in the Blue Mountains, where it's been raining for the last fortnight. Now I understand what the monsoon is like in uh, Southeast Asia and South Asia. That we've had something like it here, and everything's starting to um, mold or and uh, stick and be generally unpleasant. So uh, I understand uh, the climate of South Asia and Southeast Asia a little better now since we've seem to have acquired it lately. Um, I've listened to the last hour of talks um, at this meeting, and I must say. I almost feel like I should be talking about something else because the last hour, if I understood correctly, was mostly about obstructedification. And I felt I had a lot to contribute to that <laughs> from a very different angle. And uh, several of the last speakers um, voiced opinions I very much agree with. Like for example, this, this is the point that constipation is not obstructedification and that a lot of people seem to think it is. Um, there's barely, there's rather little connection between the two. Um, and of course, quite often, gastroenterologists and sometimes colorectal surgeons have, and us too, have contributed to uh, an enormous degree of confusion on, in, in, that, in that area. So it's a special interest of mine. And I kind of think somehow we, <laughs> you, you're asking me to do the wrong talk. But I do have something to contribute as regards uh, the as regards imaging of the anal sphincter and uh, I'm about to try and share my screen let's see whether I can do that uh, excuse me Dr. Peter it was my idea to introduce this particular topic to you because you've done such a good work in it I just wanted a oh yeah <laughs> it's not a problem <laughs> no, no, no. you see why you must understand I wanted the audience to get a 360 degrees view <laughs> You see, I'm yes, yes, yes. about Listen, um, and that is why we put in this uh, to give. <laughs> no, no, please, 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 do not, do not Excellent. consider it a criticism. It, it, it just made your meeting so much more interesting to me, and of course, that's generally a good thing, because you don't really want your invited speakers to just show up, do their talk, and disappear. You want them to. Uh, you know, interact, you want them to learn something themselves. And I've learned a few things today. So I'm very grateful for that. Don't, don't get me wrong. Now, um, I'm going to talk about um, obstetric anal sphincter trauma and its imaging. Also, the, the imaging that we use is um, useful for other purposes as well, say for a perianal fistula or for um, uh, complications after hemorrhoid surgery. Um, all kinds of other things, but we're going to focus on obstetric sphincter trauma because after all, to a urogynecological or gynecological audience, that is, um, well, that's a core interest of ours, isn't it? So, uh, not the least because um, in a number of countries around the world, um, the prevalence of obstetric sphincter tests seems to have been going up. That may partly be due to, this is in the UK, that may partly be due to uh, changes in obstetric practice. That is an increase in forceps, which has gone up a lot in the UK over the last 15 years is more than doubled. And, this, and while it's not quite as bad as that in Australia, we've certainly seen an increase in an attempt to reduce C-section rates. We do more and more uh, forceps. And the downside of that is, of course, more sphincter tears. There's also the issue of better diagnosis, because you're more, the more you focus on something, the more likely you are to diagnose it. Now, um, another interesting aspect of the talks that I've heard at your meeting over the last one and a half hours or so is, is to again demonstrate how, how wrong the standard anatomical illustrations in our textbooks truly are. And I have yet to see a realistic drawing image of the anal canal in women. Here on the left-hand side, you see a typical illustration, very similar to, in fact, probably a little better than some of those that you saw uh, uh, earlier from textbooks. And there's this peculiar idea that the libero ani seems to be in contiguity with the uh, external sphincter and the internal sphincter is way too thick here and it's too wide and too short. And 
just everything's wrong. Um, and I can tell you that everything's wrong there because I've now seen um, I've now seen in excess of five thousand. Uh, anal canals and they do in women I can't talk about men I know nothing about anatomy in men but in women they look quite different and here on the uh, right hand side you see a schematic illustration from a uh, it was done by one of my PhD students uh, you can see that the whole thing is rotated uh, sideways and uh, and anti-clockwise uh, in order to get the the um, the uh, orientation that we see when we put a transducer on the perineum. So the, the perineal body is number five. Number six is the, um, can you see my arrow? Yes, yes, Dr. Good, good, we good. can good. see. Good, so number six is the rectal vaginal septum, which is a condensation of the perineal body separating the vagina from the, uh, from the rectal ampulla. Number two is the internal anal sphincter. And what's missing here is the longitudinal smooth muscle or the, long, sorry, the longitudinal muscle of the anus, which sits between the internal sphincter and the external, but it's often invisible. It varies enormously from one person to the other. And, and the one thing that's true in the textbook illustrations is that the external sphincter tends to overlap the internal sphincter because that's the subcutaneous part of the external sphincter, and then the superficial and the deep. But what's always wrong, and you can see it here as well, is this idea that, that the, the segments of the external sphincter are somehow uh, square or cubic or something. That's, that's nonsense. These are fascicles that overlap. And in, in any muscle in your body, usually is kind of um, like a drop shape um, or a spindle shape. And the same uh, is the case for the sphincter. So the different components for the sphincter, there are spindle shapes that overlap. The same goes for the, the, the interface between the liver ani, the pubo rectalis primarily here, and the external sphincter, which is, an, an, there's an overlap there because those muscles are all spindle shaped as you can, or a drop shape, as you can see the drop shape of the external sphincter. The one thing that I would do a little different now is that I would shorten it a little here because often the external sphincter reaches higher dorsally than ventrally. And then of course, here's the mucosa and there's the anus. You, you've, um, I, I think you are supposed to hear about endoanal uh, imaging today as well. I thought that would come first in the session, but uh, if you're going to hear about it, this is, um, this is what it looks like. So uh, this is from a 3D ultrasound using a Bruel and Care machine. I have not seen anything better in endoanal ultrasound uh, uh, to this date. Um, as regards MR, that's kind of, I'm, I'm sorry to be so blunt, but that's completely useless. And this is MR of the sphincter that was published in 2019. It's from a very reputable unit in the US. Well, if that's the best they can do, um, then it's, it's beside the point. We can do much, much better with ultrasound. Um, and the systems we use are the standard 3D, 4D systems that are used in, um, in antenatal um, care around the world. The original uh, technology is uh, the Voluson systems of General Electric. And some of you may have had access to such machines. These days, the main competitor is Mindray, a Chinese system, and they're pretty good at it too. And there are several other um, manufacturers. It's just that I've always, from the very start, from 2002, or even earlier than that, since 1990, Jesus Christ. <laughs> this is actually since 1990, I've used Voluson systems. So, um, um, there you are. I must be getting old. So this is what we do. We place a we place gel on the transducer. So we uh, we cover it with a glove, and then we tilt it. We we, we normally when we do a, a, a pelvic floor ultrasound, we uh, place the transducer in the midline. And for the sphincter, the the transducer gets rotated by ninety degrees and gets tilted. Uh, quite steeply, as you can see here, because imagine where the anal canal runs. It runs rather obliquely there. So in, in order to um, hit the anal canal uh, at 90 degrees, you've got to tilt your transducer quite a bit. And the drawing on the 
right hand side in B shows you the images that you get. So there's the external sphincter as a bright ring structure, the internal sphincter as a dark ring structure, then the star shape of the anal mucosa, the ischiorectal fossa is left and right. And then very varying greatly between patients is the transversus perinae, which can come in like so I hope to show you at some stage. Um, in the uh, in images, uh, uh, for those of you uh, who've uh, repaired third or fourth degree tears, you're very much aware that the transverses can vary enormously. In some people, it looks like it's the external sphincter, which is one of the reasons why why we are getting the odd uh, false positive uh, sphincter tear diagnosis. In others, it's really not there at all. A few tricks: um, tilt the transducer more steeply than you think you should. Use one focal zone, uh, go up with the magnification so that you have that transducer and, and, and a four to eight megahertz transducer, you've got to have that between six and eight megahertz. So you, it's a, this is a near field application. So five to seven centimeters deep. Place your focal zone as close as possible to the surface. So at one and a half or two centimeters. Make sure that you're orthogonal, which means uh, I'll show you in a minute in the 3D what that actually means to make sure that you are at right angles uh, to the anal canal. Put lots of gel in the midline. There has to be lots of gel in the midline. Otherwise, when the patient contracts, um, the, the, the anus, the, the perianal skin will, will lift off, you'd, or your transducer will lift off the perianal skin, which gets pulled up, and then you can't see the bottom part of the sphincter anymore. So lots of gel there, like a standoff pad for breast imaging, say. And then do a, get the patient to do a pelvic floor muscle contraction and never save a 2D or a 3D, save 4D sine loop so that you can pick the best volume that you've produced there. And towards the end of the pelvic floor contraction, it's often a good idea to put more pressure on the perineum because the whole thing gets pulled up with a good pelvic floor contraction. So by putting pressure on the perineum, you follow up and you make sure that the focal zone is uh, that is right where you want it, which is where the external sphincter gets damaged in childbirth. So when you place a transducer the way I've just shown you in that, in that drawing, this is what you get. So the A plane, the uh, main transducer plane shows you the co a coronal or a transverse plane with the external sphincter, a bright ring, the internal sphincter, a dark ring, and then the star of the mucosa. And if you can see the transverses, it would be coming in here and there. In the B plane, you are in the mid sagittal, the mid sagittal plane, which we usually use as the main transducer plane for pelvic floor assessment. In this case, it's secondary, but we'll need it very soon in order to place our coronal slices. It, the C plane is axial, uh, or yeah, it's a, yeah, I guess uh, axial plane is probably the, the, the closest to the truth. And you, this you can use to make sure you're orthogonal. The, the internal sphincter here is that dark stripe, left and right, external sphincter here. But the, that dark stripe needs to be vertical in order to be sure that you are orthogonal. And then, of course, you want the central marker, which is that little dot here. You want that in the middle of that ring shape of the external internal sphincter. The next uh, issue is where to put your slices. And tomographic imaging has made a huge difference to what we do there. With endoanal, usually people just do a qualitative assessment. So they pull that transducer out and then they, you know, get, try and get an idea as to how much of that muscle is intact, how much isn't, and they measure the defect where it's most obvious. Uh, sometimes people do three slices, uh, top, middle, and lower anal canal. Uh, as far as I know, to date, a 3D uh, endoanal ultrasound does not allow tomographic imaging. And we've got a major advantage with this here for two reasons. One is that in the mid sagittal plane here, we can locate the caudal end of the internal sphincter, which is the end of that dark stripe here. And we can identify the cranial end of the external sphincter dorsally. Of course, you can see it even better here ventrally, but we don't use the ventral appearance because you never know what's happened there in somebody who's given birth vaginally. So the external anal sphincter is outlined here in dots left and right, uh, the top and bottom. And this structure here is what we call the facile plane. It is the uh, interface between the external anal sphincter. In this case, it's the uh, deep part of the external sphincter uh, uh, 
which is more caudal, and the pubo rectalis, which is more cranial. Like I said, sometimes you can see the longitudinal muscle of the anus, but often you can't. Now, these fascial planes that we pick up there can vary quite a bit. And for last year's Ayuga, I did a project on that. Um, you can see there are multiple uh, ways in which these uh, fascial planes can show up. And in some instances, it's obviously the pubo rectalis, like in this case, that must be the pubo rectalis. That cannot possibly be the external sphincter, which is down here. Um, sometimes it's not so clear. So for example, here, you pick up a fascial plane that is within the external sphincter. Same thing here, same thing here. And the, the echodonicity of those structures also varies. I said before, the sphincter is not made up of kind of square components like in the textbooks, it's spindle shapes. So you can see this, is, um, th this must be the deep part of the external sphincter and this must be the superficial and the subcutaneous we, we rarely see properly. In this case, this is probably the subcutaneous and this is the, um, the superficial part of the external sphincter. So, and you can see this, the, the, the overlaps are always the same in that they're spindle shaped and oblique. And then it's a matter of working out where to put your slices. So in this case, it's a little easier. There's a fascial plane here. Maybe there's one here as well. I'm not so sure this one's the more plausible. And then we slice the entire anal or the entire lower anal canal from above the external sphincter to below the internal. And because we've got those two landmarks, we can do tomographic imaging a lot better than we can for the liver, a lot more individualized. In this case, this lady has an interslice interval for, of 4.5 millimeters, which is at the top end of the range. This is a, there's a lot of muscle there, which is why I show it here because it's so particularly clear. What you end up with is a set of eight slices. The top one, by definition, is supposed to show a in inverted commas, defect, because it's above the external sphincter by definition. Up here, it's above the external sphincter. Not surprisingly, there's no external sphincter here. That's normal. The lowermost, the most caudal slice here is below the internal sphincter here. And it's not surprising that you cannot see the internal sphincter. In fact, by definition, you are not supposed to see the internal sphincter here. This is exclusively subcutaneous EAS. As has been pointed out several times, the external sphincter reaches lower than the internal. It overlaps it in a, as a, in a drop shape, as you can see here and there. Everything in between, we assess for integrity of both the bright ring of the external and the dark ring of the internal. This here is a video clip that I'll quickly run to show you how we analyze a, a, a volume, a, a scene loop of volume data sets, volume data blocks that we've uh, saved. And initially this looks really confusing, but it won't for, for, for long. So we are going to get the patient to do a pelvic floor contraction. She pulls the, watch the uh, top right. She pulls the anal canal forwards and upwards. And at some stage during this, we can identify the fascial plane between the external sphincter and the liver ani, which is just to the left and below. All that hyperechogenicity here is the liver ani. Then we adjust in order to make sure that we get our slices in the right place. So here we switch to tomographic imaging in the A plane. And then we adjust our slices both for location and for, um, for the image settings in order to optimize appearances. And I'm, I'm showing this because it's abnormal. It's clearly abnormal. This lady has a defect of the external sphincter here. Um, there's also a distortion and sometimes a defect of the internal sphincter. And this is an unusually good repair of a 3C tear in that you can see suture material here bringing the internal sphincter together very well. It hasn't quite worked so well for the external sphincter. You can see there's, an, there's a defect here. There's, there's a defect in, I'm sorry, that was not the plan. There's a defect in four out of six slices. 
And it's in fact here even five out of six. So you can see how we measure the defect size. It's in degrees. And uh, Abdul Sultan's original definition for a, a defect on, on endoanal ultrasound was 30 degrees, one hour on the clock phase. You can see it's a little different on exoanal because after all, we do not distend the um, sphincter with a probe, but we still use that those 30 degrees also nobody's really been able to, um, to, um, uh, to validate that properly. You can see there's quite a bit of sphincter here at distally that's still intact. And that was not repaired, that is native, that, that has not changed. So here, another illustration of, uh, of how we measure uh, these defects. You can see there are four, again, to remind you, we look at those, those slices here, those, those six slices. We don't count that one, we don't count that one. So this lady has a defect of over 30 degrees in four out of six slices. We call it a, a significant residual defect of the sphincter. There's a lot of um, confusion about how to describe um, such defects. Um, I've just recently um, read up on uh, what's been going on in endoanal ultrasound as uh, varying definitions over time. Um, the definition of four out of six on tomographic imaging, that is uh, standardized internationally by six international societies. Uh, IUM and Ayuga were leading in that. It's published in 2019. Uh, another interesting point, and, and adv another advantage, I should say, of exoanal over endoanal is that we can see, we can image the perineum, which nobody's ever even tried on endoanal. These are the typical appearances of a perineal tear that has led to a, a sphincter tear. So this is a three, now what is it? The internal sphincter looks pretty good all the way through. It's not even distorted. So this was, this looks like it was a 3B a perineal tear. And the difference to, a, to an episiotomy that extended will become obvious in the next slide. But here you can see that it's like a tree shape here. It's like the roots of a tree. And the, uh, the reason for that appearance, you can imagine, um, uh, in, uh, that's the anatomy, okay? So you've got several layers of tissues that have to be torn in order to get to the sphincter. And these layers of tissues will have different paths of least resistance. These, these layers will fail in different directions in different patterns. This is why you've got that zigzag here. So the, uh, the transverses will fail in a different way compared to the perineal body. And a typical zigzag appearance here, that's what a, a standard uh, perineal tear looks like. This is what an episiotomy looks like. In this case, one that was done very well. It was started slightly lateral to the midline and it was angled very steeply. This here is mostly acoustic, uh, acoustic shadowing from the scar. But I think you can see that most of the time that scar is hypoechogenic. Also, there's also hyperechoic areas like here. Anyway, it's a straight line that leads away from the sphincter as it should. If things go badly, then, uh, then you may encounter images such as this. And I should quickly say that a former fellow of mine, Dr. Subramaniam, has uh, just uh, got this paper accepted on the imaging characteristics of episiotomy scars on translabial ultrasound, which is in the Journal of Ultrasound and Medicine. And this particular lady here, you can see, uh, you can see a whole story. There's a whole story. Firstly, the episiotomy was started badly. It was if it went in that direction, it should have been started here. We call that a contralateral episiotomy. It was done too steeply so that it was angled towards the sphincter rather than away from it. And then what's underneath here, this is a 3B, the internal sphincter looks okay. This is a 3B perineal tear that is unrepaired. This is what an unrepaired tear looks like. It's wide open. It's a U. It's not an O anymore. It's a U. So in this lady, the episiotomy was started in the wrong place. It was cut towards the sphincter rather than away from it. It was cut, um, it, was, it wasn't cut shallow, it was cut steep. And then the, uh, the, the practitioners, the uh, accoucheur or the midwife, whoever it was, did not notice the 3B perineal tear that they had probably largely contributed to by doing this terrible episiotomy. So that's, that's a, um, an indictment of obstetric practice if you see something like this. Uh, another fellow of mine, Moshe Gilor, an Israeli, has uh, uh, recently worked on the appearance of uh, uh, sphincter tears after, uh, in, in a perineal clinic after repair. 
uh, two to 10 months after repair. And um, in some people, uh, it's obvious there's a, there's a big defect, like in this lady here, these are, these are both 3C perineal tears. You can see that both the internal sphincter and the external sphincter is damaged. Here as well, internal sphincter is damaged. It's not coming together here, it's a U. Uh, the external sphincter has been pulled together in an overlap repair. And the result of that is that this lady does not have a residual defect. So she has a 3C tear, but she's not classified a residual defect. So what uh, Moshe Gillor did was to uh, come up with a, um, an algorithm that would allow us to classify um, tears retrospectively. So you see somebody 20 years after the event and you can tell that was a 3C or that was a 3B or that was a 3A. We cannot distinguish between um, uh, 3C and 4 because there's no, no sonographic marker for, for mucosal damage. So it's two ways of describing uh, what you find uh, in, in, on ultrasound. And in terms of pre predictive ability for predictive power for anal incontinence, they are not much different, frankly. So there's not much to choose between them. It's just a different way of looking at it. So is it a scar? Is it a defect? Uh, is, it, um, um, is the scar hypoechoic? Is it hyperechogenic? There's a lot of to, to learn still. Um, we've also looked at medium to long term follow up an average of seven years and um, it's perfectly obvious and this has been confirmed by many others that uh, the worse the sphincter looks after a repair well of course the, uh, the, the higher the likelihood of anal incontinence. Uh, when it comes to obstetric risk factors it's very much the first vaginal delivery that does it and then there is an added risk in the grand multipress. Uh, but, and you've all, uh, you, most of you would have seen bad uh, sphincter tears in multipress women. The worst I've ever seen was in a para four with a cannonball delivery. Uh, so that happens. And this is what, what explains this effect up here. But between two and five, there's basically no difference. So it's the first vaginal baby that conveys the greatest risk. And then, of course, it's forceps. Uh, you're all aware of that. Uh, there's lots of papers out there in the literature. And this is a a meta-analysis that another fellow of mine did in 16. It's, uh, there's really no, there's no doubt that forceps is the main um, uh, modifiable risk factor for sphincter tears. So in conclusion, from a clinical uh, point of view, obstetric sphincter injury is the primary modifiable risk factor for fecal incontinence. So we need to minimize it. And if it occurs, we need to treat it well. Forceps is the primary modifiable risk factor for OAC it needs to disappear. And you may be aware, most many of you have links to, to the UK. Uh, the opposite has happened over the last 15 years because of political pressure on C-section rates. As regards imaging, um, the machines that we use, uh, 3D, 4D uh, systems that are used in obstetrics, they're everywhere. Uh, you, you're much more likely to find one of those in your hospital compared to an endoanal system. And uh, uh, after, OAC after otherwise high risk deliveries such as a forceps or shoulder dystocia. Um, these, these assessments should become routine in a perineal clinic follow up, uh, uh, at least in a, in a high resource environment. And um, to round it off, I should say it's not just to, of course, you don't just want to do, see interesting pictures. You may want to do research for which this is eminently suited, and you want to make the lives of your patients better. And you can do that in several ways, but the most obvious is to improve the diagnosis and the treatment of sphincter tears in your delivery suites. So you want a tool that provides that, you want an audit tool, both for the diagnosis of sphincter tears, and I've just shown you the Gilor score and shown you how you can do that, and for the treatment, which is follow up after primary repairs. Uh, just quickly a, a plug um, for the Ayuga Pelvic Floor Imaging Online course, um, which you can see here, one of the um, uh, six or now seven modules uh, is on sphincter imaging. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hans, for such a beautiful lecture. I think you depicted all the anatomical landmarks very beautifully in your pictures. Uh, I had one question that uh, if we uh, allow forceps to disappear, I mean, uh, can't we just give a liberal episiotomy and use forceps? <laughs> um, hmm. 
basically what you're asking is whether uh, episiotomy can be used to Prevent. make forceps less traumatic. Yeah. Maybe, I have no idea. I mean, so far, nobody's looked into this. And I guess I've just given you a methodology with which you could look into this because you personally or anybody in the audience, because you know what it's like when you cut an episiotomy, whether that is a steep or a shallow angle does not just depend on how you place your scissors. It'll depend on how distended the perineum is, how far down the baby's head is. So, so the, the crucial issue is not the angle at which you cut. The crucial issue is afterwards, was your episiotomy good enough to take the cut lateral to the sphincter? And this may or may not be the case, depending. So somebody is, and I'm very much in favor of the use of the AP scissors. They, they make it easier for people to do the right thing. But they also need to, and also the, that little pendulum at the bottom of the AP scissors makes it easier to stay on the right side, okay? To not do what we call a contralateral episiotomy. But I've just shown you a tool with which you can audit whether it actually matters, whether it, it has any, any bearing, any effect. To be frank, I doubt that you can completely avoid the excessive traumatic effect of forceps. Um, I think one could make it easier. And we've looked into what is it that does the damage to the forceps, although we're mainly interested in levator trauma, of course, where forceps is a major factor. So is it the added circumference? Um, probably not. We have we've had a study on that. It's probably not the, not the instrument. It is the force of the pull, because you can pull two and a half to three times harder than with vacuum. And it is the speed of the delivery because whether tissues reach their elastic limit or not, whether tissues tear or not will depend on force over time. So that means when you do forceps, if you, if you want to continue doing forceps, slow down. <laughs> That's the one thing that makes, that is absolutely certain to make sense, okay? Slow down. Most of the time, you're not in a terrible rush. Slow down and um, I've seen people pull like that. I mean, that's just stupid. That's just very, very bad. So it's got to be a slow, consistent no. pull. And there are now, there's somebody who's, there's a colleague in, in, in Newcastle who's invented a, a piece of plastic single-use yeah. forceps with, uh, that, with, yeah. with force transducer. And I, I would have loved to get my hands on it, but unfortunately it never worked out and then, I, and then COVID mm -hmm. happened. So, so you want to, and it's got a, like a traffic light on it. So it's a great yeah, idea a beautiful to make instrument. sure that you mm -hmm. slow down so that the, the force that you exert is not like that, but like that. Constant. Smooth and constant. Uh, I don't think episiotomy is going to make that much of a difference, but that's just my own gut feeling. So why don't you do a study on it? <laughs> Let's see, sir. But any, your any uh, pictures questions? were real feast to the eyes. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you very much. Thank it you. was a pleasure. So we move on to the next speaker. And uh, I was going through the literature and I found that uh, endoanal ultrasound has been used since 1980s. And this has been used to detect pelvic, uh, the perianal abscesses, tumors, incontinence, like you said, abscesses, and uh, to find out the cause of anorectal pains also. So our next speaker is Dr. Swapnil Sheth. He's Associate Consultant, Sir Gangaram Hospital, Delhi, with special in interest in musculoskeletal imaging, head, neck, hepatobiliary, and GI imaging. He shall be enlightening us about the role of endoanal ultrasound and MRI in assessment of patients with anorectal disorders. Dr. Swapnil Chait, please. Um, thank you, ma'am. First of all, uh, uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. First of all, I would like to thank you, Dr. Geeta Mandirata and the entire EOGD team for having me. And uh, so, uh, uh, a lot of discussion has already been done about the uh, uh, USG and uh, uh, the manometry and the obstetrical defecation syndrome. 
so uh, just to disappoint uh, i would more focus on the mri and not the and um, uh, the endovenal ultrasound as we don't usually get much of a patients uh, for our uh, endovenal ultrasound but uh, i would be more talking about the mri defecography <clears throat> so regarding the presentation so uh, first we will talk about the modalities we will compare the modalities we will also see the anatomy on the ultrasound and the mri then the procedure how we do it and also the pathologies uh, uh, we will cover try to cover the pathologies so uh, for the uh, uh, for the female perineum the imaging is being uh, used for a lot of uh, issues like a perineal trauma uh, especially the obstetric anal sphincter injury which is called as oasis also the pelvic floor dysfunction then it is also being used widely for the tumor for the benign malignant tumors and fistula and ano but uh, for the current theme of the uh, of the webinar i would be more focusing on to the first two topics that is the bar trauma to the uh, sphincter and the pelvic floor dysfunction now coming to the modalities so there are uh, various modalities like the endovenal ultrasound the mri and the 3d perineal ultrasound and dr dates has already uh, dealt with the uh, perineal ultrasound and and we have seen how uh, how nice images can come uh, we can come up with uh, and we can diagnose almost all the uh, sphincter related issues with the perineal uh, uh, 3d ultrasound but till still uh, till now the endovenal ultrasound uh, is the gold standard for all the sphincter related injuries and i would not say the all sphincter related problems but only uh, for the sphincter related injuries but it requires an expertise and also on uh, uh, some heavy instrumentations like uh, uh, an endovenal uh, probe which is a 360 degree rotating probe or uh, you can say a side fire probe and which is not very widely available everywhere and they are in also a semi invasive uh, procedure while mri is mostly uh, mri is more Uh, uh, availability of MRI is more as compared to the endovenal probe. It is non-invasive, and the advantage of MRI is to a functional as well as a structural evaluation. Uh, we'll see uh, in the next few slides how MRI can help in the management of the anorectal disorders of in the female, and it's the gold standard for the pelvic floor dysfunction and also for the rest of the sphincter disease uh, other than the injuries. and uh, it is also but there are few case uh, 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 there are few uh, publications which compare the uh, sensitivity specificity of the mri uh, uh, as uh, uh, at par with the endovenal ultrasound for oasis then there is a 3d perineal uasi which is already being uh, discussed so uh, uh, the pelvic floor dysfunctions mainly present with the constipation or may be due to uh, may be pre may present with an incon uh, in incontinence there are basically two different causes for the pelvic floor dysfunction either it is functional like a spastic perineum syndrome which now we know that when the puborectalis muscle or the anal sphincter should open up while the defecation it does not open rather it may contract and it causes a spastic perineum syndrome so for these we know that the anorectal manometry is the gold standard but here also mr defeco plays a role and we can also diagnose this with limited uh, uh, obviously with limited uh, 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 evaluation and for the structural abnormality like dr vijay rora sir said that structural abnormalities are sh should also be addressed for the obstructive defecation syndrome so for structural abnormality the only imaging modality available is the defecography now the defecography can be done on fluoroscopy that is x-ray uh, defecography or mr defecography but nowadays the mr defecography is being done widely because it provides a uh, soft tissue detail which is not available in the x-ray defecography but on the other part the disadvantage of the mr defecography is it is not done in a physiology in a physiological uh, position so why imaging is required for the any pelvic organ prolapse right like uh, you can say that the we, we can diagnose a pelvic uh, any pelvic floor prolapse by clinical examination but the clinical examination underestimates the compartments involved there are uh, at least there are three compartments anterior middle and the posterior and uh, there are chances that if there is a one compartmental involvement then there are chances that there are other there could be other compartmental involvement which can be underestimated on the clinical examination so for that the mr defecography is must and especially for the posterior compartmental prolapse the mr defecography should be an ideal investigation of the choice and like i said the only 
cons of, uh, only con of the MR demography is it is not in in the physiological position. And of course, the patients who has other contraindications for the MR like a uh, 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 like. Uh, 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 a cochlear implantation or uh, uh, a pacemaker device, then uh, we should not do it. Uh, in that fashion also, we can uh, do it by modifying these devices. So according to one paper, the manometry and MRI were uh, totally unrelatable to, and uh, uh, the conclusion was both the manometry and the MRI provide complementary information for the defecation dysfunction. So both should be done in a patient suspected of having the uh, defecation uh, problem. And another paper uh, uh, also suggested there is uh, some correlation between this test, uh, like anorectal manometry, balloon exposition test, and MRI. But they also suggested that uh, the manometry was uh, 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 peculiar in identifying the rectal prolapse and uh, large rectocele. And it cannot replace the MR defecography. So uh, the MRI for the anal canal disorders like the sphincter injury is, uh, like Dr. Deed says, is uh, not that very useful. And, it's, and uh, for that reason, it's not used routinely. And uh, however, there are a few papers which compare, uh, which suggest that it is as comparable as the uh, endovenal ultrasound or the perineal ultrasound. But they are nowadays, it is MR, use of MR is basically for the uh, study purpose only for the uh, research tool and not for the routine practice. Now, uh, female patients uh, presenting with the incontinence uh, is, a, is a significant issue, and uh, ultrasound is the first imaging uh, step to evaluate the sphincter integrity. Natologists can be either obstetric trauma or because, because of the previous any surgery. Usually the endoanal ultrasound uh, is uh, uh, done in a left lateral uh, decubitus Sorry position. Sorry to interrupt, sir. Right. Uh, your slides are not visible. Slides are not visible? Yes, sir. Okay. So all slides were not visible? Yes, sir. Uh, nobody told me. Now? Not yet. Not yet. Yes. Swapnil, we are not able to see your slides at all. Oh, ma'am, nobody told me. Just a minute. It was, just a minute. Uh, we, we, it was in the chat box we wrote. I thought we were just... No, actually, chat box is not visible. Just a minute. But, but you have explained very nicely. We would like to see the pictures, actually. Uh -huh. yeah, yes, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> sorry, my mistake. Uh, now, is it visible, ma'am? Yes, sir, it is visible now. Yeah, now it, it is visible. Yes, yes. Okay. I will... Uh, just show us the slides. Just one, uh, one minute, ma'am. Just one minute. Uh -huh. Now, is it visible, ma'am? Yes, yes, Swapnik, you are visible. Okay, okay. I will uh, go through the initial slides very rapidly. Initial slide, the picture only slide. You so, the picture is okay, ma'am. So as I said, the comparison of the endoanal ultrasound MRI and the 3D perineal. So endoanal ultrasound is gold standard for the sphincter in injuries. MRI is gold standard for the pelvic floor dysfunction and rest of the sphincter in injuries. And 3D perineal ultrasound nowadays is uh, uh, becoming a replacement for the endoanal ultrasound because it is a non-invasive. Uh, so like I said, any functional abnormality uh, uh, causing constipation can be evaluated by the anorectal manometry or MR defecography like a spastic perineal syndrome, while the structural abnormality should be evaluated on the MR defecography. The imaging is required because the clinical examination underestimates the compartments involved and failure to identify the multi-compartment involvement may lead to the failure to the treatment for the particular patient. So MR should be done in any patient who is suspected of having uh, any single compartment prolapse or having a posterior, uh, specifically a posterior compartment prolapse or posterior compartment uh, symptoms like rectocele, obstetric defecation syndrome, or anismus. The only negative point for MR is the it is not done in a physiological position. So uh, the uh, endoanal ultrasound is being done using a 10 to 10, uh, 7 to 10 megahertz side fire transrectal probe, which is uh, 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 which is inserted in uh, in a left lateral decubitus position with the knees bent, and uh, uh, usually the uh, imaging is started from cranial to the caudal. So, 
cranially so like in the first image cranially first we try to identify the gut signature of the rectum so here we can see this uh, black thick structure is the probe and after that we can see a uh, multiple ring like structures alternate hypo hyper hypo hyper kind of a thing so this multiple gut signature is nothing but the rectum we know that we are in the rectum then as we pull down the probe then we can see a uh, u shape or a horseshoe shape a uh, striated fiber posteriorly and deficient anteriorly that is nothing but the puborectalis sling so puborectalis marks the uppermost margin of the external anal sphincter posteriorly so here we should understand that the anteriorly the external sphincter is deficient at the level of the puborectalis sling so one should not make a tear at the level of puborectalis in anterior portion and while we are in the mid portion we can again see a nice uh, donut kind of a thing so here just after this black probe the echogenic thing is mucosa submucosa then this thick black or hypoechoic ring is internal anal sphincter and this afterwards the echogenic uh, slightly ill defined ring is the external anal sphincter so the internal anal sphincter appears a compact bundle of circular muscle fibers appearing as a dark ring and for the uh, any reporting purpose we use anterior as a 12 o'clock posterior as a 6 o'clock the left side of the patient as 3 o'clock and right side as a 9 o'clock this is the standard description for the reporting purpose this is actually uh, this is not a endo anal ultrasound uh, now, nowadays we are trying to focus the anal canal using the tvs probe putting it in, into the vagina and focusing the anal canal and we tried it and we uh, came up with this nice beautiful picture and we are trying to incorporate this and giving this thesis to one of our uh, 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 one of our dnb students to focus the uh, anal canal through tvs so we already know two modalities one is endoanal ultrasound using the 3d probe uh, side firing probe one is a perineal ultrasound which is already being uh, 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 already discussed by dr deeds and this is the another thing which is a tv using a tvs probe and imaging the anal canal uh, now coming to the anatomy so on mri on the right side images we can see that this is the uh, urinary bladder these are the obturator internus muscle and we can see the levator ani now the levator ani comes downwards and forms the superficial uh, the external anal sphincter and there are various components of the external anal sphincters like uh, uh, puborectalis then the deep then the superficial and the subcutaneous component while the circular fibers of the rectum forms the internal anal sphincter there are also uh, longitudinal fibers but they are usually deficient in the lower portion of these internal anal sphincter and this white fat, uh, structure between this uh, lateral pelvic wall and the anal canal is nothing but the ischio anal and ischio rectal fossa which is marked in the orange color these are the true coronal oblique and axial oblique images like in this image we can see this is the sagittal image of the mid pelvis and the planning is done in such a way that the long axis that is a coronal plane traverses through the long axis of the anal canal and the axial plane traverses perpendicular to it so it is slightly oblique as compared to the orientation of the body so the obstetric anal sphincter grading is uh, 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 as described by the sultan et al so the last two grades the grade 3 and grade 4 involves the sphincter complex and that is also as we can see here Uh, the external anal sphincter is involved uh, in uh, 3a and b according to the thickness and the uh, 3c uh, both the sphincter complex is involved and when the tear extends up to the rectal mucosa it is the grade 4 tear so here in this 3d images we try to see the uh, abnormality so in the first image here we can see there is a, a very nice round submucosa echogenic bright submucosa around the probe then the dark color uh, uh, hypoechoic band of the internal anal sphincter and then the external anal sphincter which is deficient anteriorly so there is a tear of the external anal sphincter but the internal sphincter is intact here also we can see there is a defect in this echogenic rim anteriorly and also there is a defect in this black rim so there is tear of both internal as well as external sphincter here we can see the uh, the entire ex uh, echogenic rim of external sphincter as well as internal sphincter but as we can see the between 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock rather 2 o'clock there is attenuated caliber of this black line so that is a attenuated internal anal sphincter 
suggestive of a previous injury. Here again, there is a tear of involving both the internal as well as external sphincter, but it has responded with a significant fibrosis and sometimes it can be mistaken as a tumor like in this last image. This is actually a rectal tumor. How can we say that? Because we are not at the level of the anal sphincter. The spared portion between 12 to 3 o'clock, we can see a gut signature. So we know that we are in the rectum and not the anal canal. So this is the mass and not the hypertrophied scar because of the previous injury. Now coming to the pelvic floor dysfunction. Now pelvic floor dysfunction can present a, a, as incontinence or constipation or a prolapsed pelvic organs. Now the National Institute for Health and Clinical uh, Excellence guidelines for ODS is an urge to defecate but an impaired ability to expel the bolus with following symptoms like unsuccessful fecal evacuation, excessive straining, pain, bleeding after evacuation or sense of incomplete fecal evacuation or patient resorting to the manual evacuation result. So if any of the symptoms is present, one should suspect the ODS and patient with these symptoms, MR defecography should be advised. So the, uh, uh, the evaluation of the pelvic floor dysfunction includes physical exam, anorectal manometry, balloon expulsion test, and the imaging studies as we saw. So in the imaging, we can do a, a ultrasound, X-ray, or dynamic MR defecography. So we will uh, focus more on the MR dynamic uh, defecography. So it is done at on three Tesla machine with a patient in supine position with hips and knees bent at the 45 degree. And 200 ml of the ultrasound gel is installed in the rectum using the rectal tube in the left lateral decubitus position. But you know, the patient is in the supine position and we keep the patient hip and knees bent at 45. So we don't want any obstruction while passing stool because it's not a physiological position. So we try to um, make a condition where patient feels relaxed to pass the stool. Now, there are only two basic sequences that we acquire. One is the static T2 images in the coronal and the axial plane just to localize and just to evaluate uh, the uh, pelvic structures. And after instilling the uh, ultrasound gel in the rectum, we acquire proofist images so uh, probably this will run, huh? So video is running, you, as you can see, this is a scene image, which is for, uh, so it keeps uh, taking the signal for, for uh, continuously for over the period of the 55 seconds. And we do this for uh, at rest, we repeat it in the uh, squeezing phase, we repeat it in the defecation phase. I will not go de in detail in the pelvic anatomy of the floor, but uh, as we can see here, all the structures of the anterior, middle and the posterior compartment are very well seen in on the MRI. I want, uh, so what I want you to know is, so there are three basic pelvic structures which prevents the pelvic descent. So first of all, from uh, superficial to, uh, from uh, cranial to caudal is, first of all, the endopelvic fascia, then second is pelvic diaphragm and third is urogenital diaphragm. So the endopelvic fascia covers the levators and the condensation of the fascia forms certain ligaments and structures which prevents the prolapse. Like in the anterior compartment, the fascia forms a pubocervical fascia and along with it, the periurethral ligament prevents the uh, prolapse of the anterior structure. So loosening of these structures will result into the cystocele or a urethral hypermobility or an incontinence related to the anterior compartment. In the middle compartment, the endopelvic fascia forms a periparametrium which prevents the prolapse of uterus cervix vagina. And posteriorly, it prevents, uh, it, it, it forms a perineal body which we can see just beneath the rectovaginal fascia. And it prevents the prolapse of the, it prevents the, pro, uh, uh, the widening of the urogenital hiatus. So after the first layer, that is the endopelvic fascia, the second layer comes the pelvic diaphragm, which is also an important structure and it is very nicely seen on the MR because it is consists of the all muscles like pubococcygeus, iliococcygeus and ischiococcygeus. So the most important muscles is the iliococcygeus and the puborectalis, while the ischiococcygeus is posteriorly placed posteriorly and it forms a uh, condensation of the lay, uh, both side muscles and forms a levator plate. And third is a urogenital diaphragm, which is seen anterior to the anorectum. Like here, we can see the anterior compartment is formed by the, so the anteriorly the endopelvic fascia, 
uh, prevents the uh, uh, the prolapse of the urethra and the bladder in the middle compartment the parametrium prevents the prolapse of the middle structures uh, that is a, a uterus cervix and vagina and then the posterior compartment uh, uh, the uh, iliococcygeus and the ischiococcygeus muscles prevent the prolapse of the posterior compartment so before evaluating the uh, how we read the mr defography we need to understand certain lines and angles so first of all the anorectal junction is defined as the point of taper of the distal part of rectum where it meets the anal canal that here we can see in the white arrow and uh, there is a posterior impression of the puborectalis and the levetrinae muscle over at, at the level of this junction it represents the point of reference for the descent point of reference means there are different point of reference for the different compartments which we see whether it comes below the pubococcygeal line to call it a descent or a prolapse so for the posterior compartment this is the anorectal junction the second thing is the anorectal angle so this is the angle between the central axis of the anal canal and the posterior border of the distal part of the rectum so normally at rest the angle is acute uh, that it prevents uh, it, it is in a tight uh, condition uh, it is in the contraction so it prevents the rectal prolapse and it provides a parasympathetic uh, uh, control of the uh, sphincter so while contraction it becomes more acute contraction means squeezing it becomes more acute while during defecation it it is relaxed to allow the stool pass then there are various line that are being used for the uh, defecography one is the pubococcygeal line so here we can see the red line which is from the inferior border of the pubic symphysis to the last coccygeal segment the second is the h line the blue line which is from the inferior border of the pubic symphysis to the anorectal junction again the indentation where uh, indentation of puborectalis and the third line is the m line which is a perpendicular line from the pubococcygeal line to the anorectal junction so the h line is nothing but the hiatus line which is a levator hiatus so the pellicular descent by uh, considering its h and m line can be divided into the mild moderate severe according to this measurements now coming to the compartments so the anterior compartment is formed uh, by the urethra bladder and urethra and the uh, prolapse of these structures can result in cystocele or hypermobile urethra the middle compartment including a virtual cul-de-sac compartment through which the peritoneal seal occurs so uh, uh, um, these compartments uh, the abnormalities of the this compartment uh, includes uterine prolapse androcele peritoneal seal and sigmoidocele while the posterior compartment is formed by the rectum and anal canal and uh, the abnormalities include Uh, anorectal descent rectocele or intussusception now the prolapse can also be uh, graded according to the how much uh, this uh, how much centimeter they uh, come uh, go below the pubococcygeal line so there is rule of 3 so till 3 cm it is called mild 3 to 6 it is called moderate and more than 6 it is called severe why mild moderate severe because in mild and A mild to moderate uh, prolapse so usually the surgery is not indicated while the, in the severe descent the surgery is indicated especially when it is associated with the prolapse now what is prolapse we will see further there are two different kind of the surgical pro procedures that are being done for the obstructive defecation syndrome one is star and one is pop star star is nothing but a stapled transanal anorectal rectopexy which is indicated into the intussusception and the pop star is done when there is associated pelvic organ prolapse or other compartmental prolapse or where where there is tri compartmental descent so we will try to understand the each compartment uh, prolapse and what are the surgical procedures are being done so that's how we can understand the impact of imaging on the management so in the entire compartment when the uh, like in the first image when the bladder goes beyond the pubococcygeal line like here it is called as a cystocele and it is it can be also graded according to the how many centimeters goes beyond the pubococcygeal line and for this the surgery required is a retropubic urethropraxy in the second image we can see there is a sagging of the urinary bladder on both side of the vagina it is because of the tear of the parametrium and in the third image we can see that there, there is high urethral hypermobility now what is the urethral hypermobility so in usual position the urethra is a vertically oriented but when there is significant uh, cystocele the urethra becomes a horizontal and again becomes a uh, normal in position when the patient is not straining so this is called as urethral hypermobility 
So when the cystocele is associated with urethral hypermobility, then another surgery is required, which is called as pubovaginal sling. So how a defecography can change the management in the same patient? If the patient is only cystocele, the, on, the, only the urethropexy is required. While if uh, uh, the patient has a urethral hypermobility, the patient requires pubovaginal sling. The same in the middle compartment. Middle compartment consists of the genital organs. So either it can be a complete uterine prolapse where the vaginal walls are reverted and the uterus is seen as a bulging mass outside their genitalia or there can be a vaginal vault and cervix fluids. Like in the first image, we can see the only the cervix is coming below this blue line, which is represent the vivo oxygen line. While in the second image, we can see the portion of the uterus along with the anterior and the posterior compartment structures like the bladder and the, uh, and, and the rectum are also coming way beyond the vivo oxygen line. So this kind of tricompartmental collapse requires a pop surgery, pop star surgery. Now coming to the peritoneal seal, the peritoneal seal occurs through a virtual compartment between the middle and the posterior compartment where we can see a rectovaginal septum, right? So uh, here we can see that the fat, intra-abdominal fat is coming down below the pivot oxygen line. So this is nothing but the peritoneal seal. So for the isolated peritoneal seal, nothing to be, uh, uh, no surgical treatment is required. Uh, coming to the posterior compartment. So, the posterior compartment, for the posterior compartment, anorectal descent is the descent of the anorectal junction below the pivot oxygen line. It can be again graded by rule of three. And uh, isolated presence of the anorectal descent has no value. And uh, uh, basically, this patient does not require surgery and we should try to look for the other symptoms, uh, other causes for the uh, patient's symptoms. Then coming to the rectocele, rectocele is uh, the outpouching of the rectum. So there are two types of rectocele, there is anterior rectocele and posterior rectocele. So again, the when there is abnormal descent, the stool gets accumulated and there is because of the increased intrarectal pressure, the wall uh, becomes lax and this kind of rectocele are formed. So again, isolated rectocele are not treated if they are not associated with the prolapse or into susception. Like here, there are three different cases. Like in the first image, we can see there is a indrawing of the mucosa and we can see there is a mucosal prolapse which is also called as a rectorectal because rectum is prolapsing into the rectum. In the second image, the rectum is prolapsing into the anal canal. While in the third uh, image, the entire rectum has come out of the anal canal and it is protruding outside the anal canal. This can be seen also on the a clinical examination. So all these three patients should be treated with the STAR surgery. We're coming to the spastic perineal syndrome. So this is the one syndrome which can be diagnosed by the MR defecography or manometry. And the, uh, uh, here on the MR defecography, as we can see here, the anorectal angle uh, uh, remains stable, static, and it does not become obtuse or increase while it should while defecating. So the management required here is a manometric guided biofeedback, which is already being covered by Dr. Hari Shrihari. Then there is descending perineal syndrome. So the tricompartmental descent is also called as a descending perineal syndrome, and the management involves the pop star. So to conclude, so MR uh, uh, depending upon the MR defecography findings, the management changes. So if there is only posterior compartmental descent without into susceptions, so uh, we should look for the other causes for the patient etiology. If there is posterior compartmental descent with into susception, it can be either rectorectal, rectoanal, or a complete uterine prolapse. The patient will require a STAR procedure. If there is a combination of a, a middle and the posterior compartment descent, then the pop star is required. And when there is a tricompartmental descent, then we should also look for the other abnormalities. Like if the cystocele is the associated, then we can do a pop star with retropubic urethropexy. Or if there is urethral hypermobility, we can do a pop star with pivovaginal sling. Just to show you a few images uh, where MR can also help in other anorectal disorders like 
nowadays the mr is the gold standard for the local regional staging of the ca rectum and we do get uh, now a lot of cases of the ca rectum for the local regional staging because it decides for the uh, for the uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy and uh, we also know the perianal fistula it is a routine uh, uh, procedure being done so the defecography uh, just to sensitize uh, 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 the defecography is being done in our department for last more than 10 years but we get most of our refers from the surgical departments and not from the gynae so i just want to after this lecture maybe uh, uh, gynecologists are also sensitized to um, send the patient for the uh, suspected cases of the pelvic floor prolapse for the defecography thank you Hello, Dr. Swapnil. It was an excellent presentation. You have uh, highlighted the importance of MR defography in especially prolapse patients, which we are not doing. And uh, you have beautifully highlighted uh, different uh, anterior prolapse, uh, cystocele, rectocele, and which surgery is required in which place. And uh, thanks for the input for the use of TVS probe for the uh, imaging of uh, anal canal. Thank you. It was an excellent lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Swapnil and Dr. Neerja, Dr. Sonal and Dr. Mala. And that was a wonderful presentation. I would like all the speakers to be present and uh, we can have, uh, if there are any queries uh, in the chat box, there are none. But Dr. Amita, who had to go for a surgery, has sent one question. And I'm just reading out the question for all the, uh, uh, especially this is... <laughs> Uh, so she has asked that there are a lot of similarities between the physiology of urinary and fecal uh, incontinence and continence, and therefore also many tests and investigations are done to make diagnosis of various dysfunctions of these two systems, systems and they have the same concepts. Now, few conditions like levator ani syndrome shows dysfunction of both. Can we develop a system where urinary and fecal dysfunction can be diagnosed at the same sitting or simultaneously or some screening test which we can adopt to convenience the patient uh, and anal manometry. So maybe Shri and Zubin can uh, uh, throw some light and then maybe Swapnil can tell us if some radiological modality, you know, she wants to know if some modality where both the anal and urinary symptoms especially levator ani syndrome, we can combine our diagnostic modality. Shri Zubin. Yeah, yeah. So uh, in the manometry, there have there were attempts to um, classify problems with levator ani as an entity which is separate from the uh, sphincter apparatus, that is the internal and external sphincter. However, uh, studies have shown that we are still not able to classify the effects of both individually based out of manometry. So whatever we see is the end result of the entire apparatus working together. We cannot subclassify whether this effect is because of the levator ani or this effect is because of the external sphincter uh, in independence. So as of now, uh, I don't think we have the, uh, the capability to do that. Uh, I am also not aware of any functional tests uh, based on the principles of manometry available for uh, urodynamics as of now. Um, uh, I would like to also understand from other speakers if they are aware of it. Right. That's an interesting thing. Maybe Swapnil, can an MRI give an answer? Actually, uh, functional things. So as you um, pointed out in your lecture, it is more for a anatomical discussion yes, and yes. maybe a functional would be more of an MRI difficography. Yes, yes. Can you do a, a micturating cystogram or, a, you know, kind of a thing? So, uh, ma'am, regarding MR defecography, so as I said, MR defecography provides functional and structural both. Predominantly for structural abnormality, it is done. So, uh, for MR, sometimes what happens, the patient does not defecate. So, naturally, it becomes an uh, spastic perineum syndrome. Correct. So, there is this, uh, uh, you can say, uh, 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 MRI disadvantage. It, there are a lot of other causes like uh, patient is not comfortable. It is very difficult to defecate in a supine position. Yeah. So, but for us, it is really difficult whether it's because of these uh, issues or whether there is actually a spastic perineum. So, sometimes we can see a rather uh, 
dyssynchrony between the puborectalis and this uh, uh, defecation. So sometimes we can see that the patient is trying to defecate. There is a normal descent which occurs in all the patient, but the puborectalis does not relax. Rather, the anorectal angle becomes more acute <laughs> than it should uh, be wider, right? As it should be expected. So, in these cases, we can diagnose spastic perineum, but if patient does not defecate, then it really becomes for us to label it, because once I label it as a spastic perineum, what happens in radiological report, once we label it, it becomes, it stays there. Yes. yes. So, yes. That, that is this, that, that is the disadvantage. Very interesting, very interesting. I think we've had an extremely, extremely illuminating and a very, very useful session, and especially as Dr. Neerja said, with prolapse and I've had a personal experience with a patient where it an intussusception was missed and just a rectocele repair was done. She had this uh, odious like symptoms and she didn't improve. We just simply did a rectocele repair, but she didn't improve. It was actually a recto rectal recto intussusception. She actually needed a star to ah. start. So, so here, you know, your lecture has really illuminated us and told us, and as Dr. Nija has very rightly pointed out, we should take a very appropriate history and as Dr. Zubin in his lecture and Sri told us, we have to really listen to what the patient is saying and accordingly tailor our uh, investigation uh, uh, things. And if there are no more questions in the chat box, I would like to conclude this session and I would like to invite Dr. Sharmishta to give the vote of thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, and uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Ashla Patna for organizing such a nice game which enlightened all the obstetrician of the topic which was so untouched and so less understood by all of us. So first, I would like to congratulate and uh, I'm really grateful to all the speakers and the moderators today for taking us through this wonderful journey. Dr. Sandhya and Dr. Zubin Sharma for uh, revising our anatomy and physiology of the anorectal sphincter and the perineum. Dr. Srihari, I mean, I don't know, words fall short to thank you for what you have told us today, the information you gave us today. Now, so much things over which were under, uh, not very well understood. You made us very clear. Now we know which patient needs what. Thank you, Dr. Srihari. Now we have Dr. Hans-Peter Dyes and Dr. Swapnil. Wonderful images, like we have never seen before. The endoanal and the exonal ultrasound, which you have shown us. Like so many things we used, which we used to miss, like the patients with OSS, now the patients coming with perineal seal, recto seal. We understood so much. We got an opportunity to learn so much from you. Thanks a lot, sir. Thanks a lot. And with that, I would like to conclude the session for today. And um, and all the chairpersons, uh, I really, I mean, I don't know what to say. Uh, words fall really short for you guys. Um, you, you have been so enlightening. And uh, not to forget Dr. Renuka for being there since the beginning and um, for, uh, for the successful completion of the CME. I would like to congratulate Dr. Renuka also. And again, thanks a lot and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.